the mistakes that self-taught mini painters make. Every single painter has a different way or approach. Expectation doesn't always meet reality. It's more about the, the spectacle of the whole army rather than the individual. Why am I limiting myself to painting that way when there's no rules? I think if you can combine those two things and synergize them together in the way that your mindset is, you'll have massive gains when it comes to your execution models. Well, this week we've got uh, we've got Paul on the show again because everyone decided that they mm. was going to get really, really ill like the day before filming. So cheers for that. Excuse me. I've been getting my best grey night on and fighting Nurgle for the last <laughs> couple of days. Like I, I, I beat this thing in like in like a day or two. So I'm quite uh, I'm quite happy with that. I, I do apologise for anyone watching or listening. I have the best Phoebe voice on from Friends. If anyone gets that that analogy, but um. But yeah, um, Joe did not. Uh, Joe did, did not, not succumb no. to the same fate. So, no. yeah, was, but don't no. worry, Joe. If you're listening, I know you are. We've yeah. got your favourite substitute. That's it. I have once again been wheeled out of the darkness and born onto the light. Always back once... again, like Slim Shady, but the forty, the, but the forty k edition. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. No, it's been uh, good. I I'm stunned that on the episode with Peachy last week, you dropped the most. ridiculous ridiculous sentence I've ever heard in my life of the DeWalt sniper. And yet, somehow, he always manages to do this, James yep. will say something absolutely insane, and the listeners, for some reason, will all band behind him. I'd just like to, to take a moment to apologise to absolutely nobody who uses a <laughs> pin vice. Um, the DeWalt sniper does not, does not do anything but use a power tool for barrel drilling. One hole, one drill every time. So, yeah. well, so, is, that, is that like the tagline? Like that's, that's one his, uh, one, his one, superhero one tagline. A sniper is one shot, one kill. So one hole, one drill kind of works. Well, if you've so, got one hole, you don't need the drill because you've already got the hole. No, Do you mean you, one drill, one hole? No, because you use the muzzle brake. It's already a hole. So that's, okay. that's put me in my place, isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> All, all I can following think the advice from when, the episode very well. With well Apple, all right? I can think of when you said about using the drill to do a barrel is slipping and drilling f straight through your finger. Well, uh, which I have you done. You spend a lot it's of time around Ad in, when you when you and he, he he I converted him to the power of electricity, yeah. and he has never looked back. So. My favourite thing was uh, in our company uh, Slack channel. We had <laughs> we had oh, artists. That was amazing. Someone sent in a. It was like a JCB dr like digger drill, <laughs> and they was like just on my way to drill my my weapon. Do some barrels. It's the best. That, that I've got to give it to, to Ben who done that because that made me laugh quite a lot. That was brilliant. Um, uh, I was feeling quite bad on Friday and uh, he did make me laugh. So yeah, um, but no, yeah, I, I yeah. Mm -hmm. All I was going to say is thank you to all the all the listeners and viewers of the show for rallying behind the power of electricity. Literally no one. And just it was like six people. With me. He, he's, he's acting like he's starting. Oh, it's gone up That's since then. It's about ten now because I've been checking the comments <laughs> religiously. So twenty-seven thousand odd views on YouTube that episode, and James is like six people banding behind yeah. him. Yeah, starting a real. Look, I can only base it upon the comments, and the comments were completely in favour of of the drill. So I, I, yeah, perhaps suggest doing it the you know the traditional way first before you go straight. I did to the put power a caveat tools. in the episode. Yeah. I did say, and I, I just you can go back and say I did caveat like if you. Do use it for the first time and you have issues. It's, it's <laughs> like, like drilling through your finger. Not, it's not my. It's that's not my. It's not my. That's fault. an issue. But, um, but We're yeah, not responsible you, for any uh, personal injury. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> unfortunately not. But no, yeah, lots of people. It was really. Do you know? It was really, really heartening to see so many people that do use it. Um, you know, and um, and we had a bit of a conversation in office oh. because because. I know George at the time was like, oh, it's all, it's either all, full or nothing. But I, I, I grabbed a drill from, from Adam's room <laughs> and showed George in, in real time in real that time. You, you can control the trigger on the drill. Wouldn't it be simpler to use, you know, you can get the little Dremel things yeah. and put a drill bit into that. Well, actually, uh, one thing that a lot of people suggested was this product called the Wow Stick, which yeah. I have not used, mm. but I've seen online. I'm aware that it's a popular tool. A wow Stick. It's basically like a, an electric screwdriver, but it's got gotcha. an adapter to have a, a drill bit yeah, on yeah. It's a drill with stabilizers, like, basically. It's something that's easier to handle yeah. than a, yeah. you know. But personally, maybe I'm just the weird guy, but I have not found it that arduous to just sit there and do that. No, I mean, yeah, but, yeah, uh, well, with, with I mean, respect. I have got the little tiny needle drills, and I have snapped a couple off in the model. With, so with respect, your 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 amount of barrel drilling is not 
very much, George. No, let's no, put no, it. Let's, no, be, no, let's, no, be, no. let's be honest. No, 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 no. With the five, with the, no, with the five models he done last <laughs> last year, and then the, and then the six models the, that he's done this year. Let's so, back this up. I paint a lot of models. I paint a lot of armies. They just don't happen to be for myself. They have to be for commissions. I've drilled many a barrel in my time. Well, either way, the 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 power of electricity won won that that mm. that argument, and um, I'm pleased for everybody who uses a drill. You know. Um, <laughs> So, yeah. I love that he thinks he won. He's I like, know, yeah, it's like some sort of he's like another victory. Win. Another victory was, for the dual sniper. I was vindicated in the comments. So and this uh, is your paint a sprue moment, isn't this it? Is my paint a sprue yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah. D- yeah. D- drill. Yeah, I still think that's one of the best hobby hacks we've done, though, Paul. Like, a drill. It, you, no, no, the sprue. <laughs> the sprue was the sprue was. <laughs> yeah, yeah for, for the listeners who might not have caught a previous episode where we had Paul on, he dropped the knowledge bomb yeah. of uh, using leftover sprues to practice your edge highlighting, and the listeners that was a movement, James. They were they were flocking to that yeah. one. It's you good. wait until the next hack. We, we using a potato. I'm not going to reveal at the moment. You'll have to wait till the end of the episode for that. So, <laughs> okay. <yeah. laughs> okay. So to practice drilling. No, I can't do it. I can't do it. <laughs> stay, stay. Wait till the end of the episode. <laughs> okay. Well, we've had uh, we've had a few guests on actually in the last uh, last couple of weeks. We had Liam Dempsey on. We had Peachy as well last week. Yeah, gl- pre- I'm glad I get to follow one after Peachy. That's. Uh, that's good. When you first came on, the, the the people were watching and people listening were raving, Paul. So so like we had to get it's you back on. What I do, I suppose. I mean, it was a convenient situation that both <laughs> Joe and myself have been <laughs> it was. at Doors Death yeah. with obviously the, the Nurgle True. infestation we've been fighting. Yeah. But, um, um, no, well, actually, this is actually 4D chess. This is a part of a bigger, grander scheme to get Paul to replace Joe on the show. <laughs> I just want to say, Joe, I didn't I didn't say that. Just just so you're aware. I'm not ganging up on you. They are. <laughs> so, I'm not ganging up I am. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you feel better, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but no, yeah, it's been really good to have uh, both Liam on and, and Peachy just obviously mm. to completely different perspectives to, to the way that they ap- approach miniature painting. Um, I think there's a lot of take home uh, from the, both of those episodes for different for different purposes. Obviously, Liam's approach to obviously not looking at social media. Peachy's approach to obviously just painting and, and being that kind of like building block for a lot of painters that start out in, in with miniature painting. And mm. that, the thing that really happened for me was like, when you when you compared it to DIY, and it's like you don't see videos of people that using a screwdriver or you or how to use a screwdriver or how to use a drill, no plug. Um, a, lot of assumed, you know, a lot of assumed knowledge. Going yeah, in. assumed knowledge. Yeah. So that was a really and it really for me, I was like, do you know what? You're actually right. And like again, his approach for doing the content that he's doing and the way that he's approaching sort of like uh, miniature painting guides and stuff is really good because it's right for that base level that does exactly the comparison to what he was suggesting about the drill or the screwdriver or how to measure. a a thing for a door or whatever it was you're yeah. saying but yeah um, and actually i think you, you a lot of newer people to like you need that because i'm quite a visual learner so like you get these some tutorials i think so they sort of you think well you've missed the step there you've told me how to do that and now you're showing me the end product but how did you apply what you've told me to do to get to that point which is i, I quite i quite like the the way of um explanation demonstration and then imitation so things are explained to you they then demonstrate what they've explained to you and then you get the chance to have a go at it yourself and that that's a good way of learning to do something yeah i really like that yeah mm. yeah it's kind of opened my eyes a little bit as well because as someone who's always trying to push my paint into higher and higher standards mm. it's kind of um going to make me a bit more cautious with the like assumed knowledge thing so yeah I'm my eyes a little bit um when helping other people out yeah um that's why they sort of say that no no question is a stupid like a one. stupid no question. definitely yeah. not yeah, yeah definitely not because just because you know the answer doesn't mean everybody else does i yeah. think we're fortunate actually in this hobby that there is generally speaking quite a good community approach there is yeah. yeah yeah there is, yeah i don't I, I don't really ever see people like putting a question in unless they they they're a bit cautious about asking those questions, but I don't really ever see someone asking the question. You always see people going, oh, you know, what, what do people recommend for this? So I'm not, I've never done this before. What's the best approach? A lot of people rally around and help, which I think is obviously mm. just a good thing. Um, it just shows the type of industry and type of community that we got, which is great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hot, well, it's been a while since it's been a, been Sans guest. So what have the hobby updates been for the past, well, I guess, three weeks? Um, well, I haven't done much, being honest. I've been pretty busy with work. There's lots of things going on that I've kind of kept me a bit busy. You've um, done the, um, you've done the Callus and Toll uh, preview for GW? I, I did actually, yeah. To, to be fair, I did. Uh, that was a bit of a, I saw that model, fell in love with it, and I was like, I, I have to paint that model because I enjoyed it. Um, 
I did set myself a little bit of a challenge, I'm being honest. Um, uh, some would say challenge, some would yeah, say some delusional <laughs> expectations. Yeah. All I'm going to say... He's got 30 tanks to paint yet, so... All I'm going to say is I did it. So I, I took it home... No, 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 no. You did it. Yeah, fair enough. You did do it late. Late, mid-morning... <laughs> Not at nine AM. I mean, like, it's it's all a bit vague. Like, it's all relevant. Isn't it's all isn't relevant. It? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's all, yeah. You know. But I think the thing is, is yeah. So I took it home. Or I took it home the evening before at five o'clock or five thirty when we finished uh, the office, and it was bare plastic built, and it came in the next morning. At, I think it was about half ten, fully painted and done. So I don't think. Yeah, that's not bad. I don't think I got. I got. I got it. And there was no. There was no. No major painting in the more in the um in the in the morning. It was only a couple of little bits that I just wanted to sort out on it. But yeah, I was quite happy with that. Like I said, um, yeah, when I it, so I, I, I wanted you I, on your desk with all the paints. Set yeah, up, I had I had a bit of a I had a bit of a thing where line. I was like, I think there was one in the previous episodes where it was like, you know, I, if you set, I do like a challenge, so like I took it home thinking, right, yeah, I'm going to try and get it painted and get it done in time. Uh, one thing I really did actually want to do with it as well is because um, Adam painted the other two characters. He painted, I can't remember what her name is, but Cat Lady. I'm just going to call her that. Um, Perfect. I think, I'm sure that's what it says on the box. Yeah, Cat Lady. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Official. Yeah. 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 Um, I had done this awesome purple cat uh, with her, which is great. Um, but the overall vibe that we, that from we spoke with Adam and, and spoke about what we want to do with them is, yeah, copy and box art would have been great. But I think I, I look at those sort of like uh, vampire hunter models from Age of Sigma or from, from that game. And I just see them as Inquisition. They just look like yeah, Inquisition do, yeah. to me. So what we wanted... It's the hats. Yeah, the hats. <laughs> yeah. What we wanted to do was was basically wrap them in, in kind of Inquisitional colours. So like dark reds, maroons, blacks, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with like blue, cold kind of highlights and stuff like that. And then, yeah, so I had done those two models, the, the Cat Lady and uh, the other one that's got the... The, the the torch and the sword I can't remember their name uh, being frank well it's Callus and Toll so he's yeah. one of them I think it's yeah, yeah. Toll Cat Lady and Torch Man Cat, that's perfect there we go <laughs> Cat Lady and Torch Man um, and uh, I've done a great job on those and then yeah I've done Dual Pistol Guy um, uh, yeah, we'll <laughs> so just... sorry to any AOS fans yeah. this is really shocking. helpful you can correct me really in the comments helpful. hey look I'm ill alright okay I'm still fighting Nurgle um, but uh, different different game system different yeah. game system Nurgle's in Nurgle's in oh, I suppose it is. what are you on about oh, no too yeah. shy too shy <laughs> serve that one right back at you like a henman <laughs> um, but yeah uh, but no um, yeah so I, I, I massively enjoyed it I just wanted to paint that model uh, from the moment I saw it I really just thought yeah it's a phenomenal model the, the pose was great um, it's a little bit tricky to paint actually because obviously I, I built it a single piece and then had both the arms where they're right in front of him so the axis was axis was a bit difficult on the front mm -hmm. but it was still it was, yeah it's great he's got this really cool kind of like almost like uh, I don't know what type of it's like a padded kind of like armoured kind of like part on the lower portion of the body which was really cool um, and I, I used red for that um, which was great and then just done like purple there's this little gem that, you, that I didn't even realise the model had until I had had it in hand to paint it it's got this little kind of like purple gem on just on like one of the one of the lapels here so I painted that in purple as well which I thought worked quite nicely with the red and stuff so yeah it was, it was a real fun real fun model to paint I had a blast of it I'll ask. Well, I won't ask how many you've painted because that's that's a waste of time. How many yeah. tanks have you bought since uh, since we last spoke? Yeah. Next question. Well, uh, actually, since we last spoke, not been that. Not I, been that. I don't think any more have arrived. No, it has, no. That you know of, Paul. It, no, 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 no more have arrived opened. at the office. Yeah, yeah. No, no, there are no more. Like we're at, we're at max. Ah, stuff we're, still arrives we're, at the we're, office. We're at, we're at, we're at James, max. We're at max capacity now. Like regarding but, tanks. Yeah. Like um, go on. What's the count? Uh, I don't know. I genuinely don't a scary know. I, I'm pretty scary. sure the most recent tank that I saw him buy was at War Blue. Was it War Boot that it, you got one? Oh yeah, I got a demolisher, got, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You got another yeah. You got one of, we went there uh obviously to to sell stuff at War Boot. And James Boyd. And James stuff. buys stuff. Yeah. He's, he's there buying things. Yeah, so. I was just getting rid of I'll get rid of some grey shame and That's also it. just getting and a couple buying of, some more. I've got Someone one, else's one tank. <laughs> just one tank. So. It's a big grey shame swap. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, so it's a swap meet. That's what it is. Then. It's fine. No, uh, I don't know how bad it is, but the, I have now decided that that is it for tanks. So we're done. We've yeah. got we've got full full believe full that. everything I need for tanks is done. There's going to be some other parts. Uh, can't wait to of, roll. Can't wait to roll this back in, uh, yeah, in a few months in a and uh, months. see you say There's that. There's been a lot of random little parts appearing. So four tanks. Yeah, like, like tracks. For, yeah, a couple of track extra tracks. Well, yeah, no, those tracks are for the the main part of the main sort of jewel in the crown, if you want to yeah. put it anyway, of, of the Morning Army, which is um, uh, an old Forge World Baneblade. So I bought one. I that was, a, yeah, yeah it's great, great kit. Cool. Um, it, it needs some work. It needs, yeah. it needs a, you know, if, if, um, if uh, you know anyone's watching that gets into car car sort of repairs from from husking Hulk to a brand new brand new repaired um, 
uh, vehicle if they're interested. Miniature in. tank restoration. Yeah. 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 it will be like those videos on, uh, do you ever see those like obviously fake videos yeah. on YouTube where they'll get like an old Hot Wheels car that looks like it's been under the sea for 35 years? <laughs> yeah. And then they'll make it pristine. James yeah. likes to do that yeah. with a lemon rust. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I This Bane Blade is, is something that I always wanted back in the day and I never could get one and um, I just couldn't afford to get one and I couldn't, couldn't get one and um, yeah, one became available and I was just like, right, yeah, I have to have to have that because it, it fits really well with Mordian. So yeah. So, yeah. Um, Paul, so, yeah. you done a uh, you finished your Harbinger of Decay? I did. Yeah. I finally managed to finish it. Um, it looks amazing. So I it does quite, look sick. I was quite happy with that. I must admit, Absolutely it was my. It. it was it. It's like I said to to George. It was one of those. You have that sort of miniature where you think you. Or I think it was the same to you as well. It was something finally clicks into place, and you. It, it's, it's almost like you've taken another step up in the in the painting journey, or whatever you want to call it. You know, we sort of. It's one where you look back and you're like, yeah. that was the one. Yeah, that's kind of, things have gotten better there. at that point. Some, something's happened there and it's come, some, things have come together. Cause compared to my other stuff, it makes me want to throw my other things away. Don't do it. Because I'm not going it's, it's, to, but it, it's quite nice because I keep looking at them and thinking, uh, and also that, that harbinger is now sat on my shelf and every time I walk past, I go, I painted that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I painted yeah, that. Definitely. Um, I, I also recently got my dad onto WhatsApp so I could send him pictures. And we had this quite nice little thing where, you know, he's 70, but he's still my dad. And he took, he showed him the pictures and he's, oh, that's really good. You know, you should enter that into a competition. So it'd be fantastic. It's really good. And, you know, it's like, he's still my dad and he still likes the artwork that I do every now and again, you know, and it's well, that's, quite that's a nice, nice moment. Opinion. But that, I was quite, I'm still quite happy with that. And I keep looking at it and thinking, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, I'm happy with that. And it's quite nice. Thank you. To, uh, smashed it. It's to, really, really good. It. It's always good when you have a model that you can see tangible like jumps in progress in sort of like the way yeah. you paint it, the way that it finishes. Even even like a technique perhaps that you've done previously on multiple, multiple models, but seeing it culminate in like the best version of, yeah. the, of the way you've done it and that I, model. I painted that so differently to the way that I painted anything else before it. And it's just such a difference. Do you want to unpack that? Like what, what was it that was different? <laughs> Well, like last time I see you, it was sort of saying about relying on contrast paints and, you know, that sort of thing. Whereas with the Harbinger, I didn't do any of that. I, it, I just, you know, I painted, I want to say properly, but I, I paint, I thinned my paints properly. Um, I, I sort of tackled each piece systematically rather than doing a bit of this and doing a bit of that and then forgetting where I was with that bit and trying to, you know, get back into the flow of things. I... I painted when I wanted to paint because I think that's quite important for me. If I, if I sit down at a table and I'm not really interested in doing it, I paint a lot worse. You can tell he's been listening to the show, can't you? Yeah, I, I, I do. You know, I, I, on, on a Friday when I do my painting, I have the podcast on. But, you know, and so it's like the other day, I, obviously with what I'm painting at the minute, um, over the weekend, I really wasn't interested in painting at all. Mm -hmm. And I sat down to paint and um, I did paint, but I, I wasn't happy with it in the end. So I, I stripped the model and I started to get, like yesterday on the way, to, at eight o'clock in the morning, this is like 45 minutes before I have to sort of leave the house for work. Suddenly, <gasps> I was in the mood for painting. So I sat down and I repainted what I'd done over the weekend. And it's a hundred times better. Yeah. And that's just because of my mindset, I was in the right place at that particular time. It, 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 to really, paint. it really shows how important so, actually like the, the mood and the mindset to, to painting that actually is like, mm. it, it, you know, I think it's something we've spoke about it before many a time, but it's something we get asked about all the time, but like it really shows how important that actually is about yeah. the, the execution of painting. Miniatures. It's not just the enjoyment either. It's like the results are, like you said, obviously yeah. drastically not, different. It, you know, just forcing yourself to do something is never good. Yeah. Um, especially if you're not really interested in doing it at that particular point. So, I mean, and also I, I think I used, I didn't rely on washes so much to shade like the fabrics on that harbinger and things like that. I did, I did use um, some, some, some shading paints from Citadel but far less than I would normally sort of lean on them. So what did you, things. what did you do? Did you just dilute down just massively sort of darker. Yeah, yeah. Just, uh, just was uh, you like kind of making your own washes or was you treating it more? I like did a make a few glazing? of my own washes rather than just relying on Agrax or no no oil to to do, do everything for, for you, me. Yeah. Um it's I think it's just the process of 
thinking about what I'm doing mm-hmm. for a change rather than sort of just going with the flow. Right, I've painted this, let's wax some known oil on it. That's that shaded. Now I can move on. Whereas with the Harbinger, it's actually, you know, trying to use the correct paints on each part, you know, pro- do some proper highlighting, sort of line highlighting and water my paints down so they actually float off my brush pop- properly. That leans into um, the like critical thinking that we've spoke about before where like thinking about why you're making the choices you're making and all yeah, that correct, yeah. rather than just doing it because <clears throat> you feel like you're supposed to or it's like, what, yeah, it seems like the next logical step. And also, for the sake of it. I mean, sure, I made mistakes on it. It's not perfect. Um, but um, it, I can learn from those sort of mistakes. I know what I did wrong. I know how to correct what I've done wrong on it. And uh, of course, that's just going to hopefully set me up for the next one. But I seem to go through this phase where I, I do, I don't know if anyone else does this, but I go through a, a bit of a phase where I do three or four really awesome models. And then the next one I do, I feel like I'm painting the same way that I did before, but it just doesn't turn out right. <laughs> so... What, could but, that could that be that you're you're perhaps experimenting with different colors or things that you've not used before? So even though the, the what you're hoping to to the, the the way you're trying to finish it and, and render the model yeah. is the way in line with the way you've done previous models. Sometimes, yeah, sure. It could be new new paints. Just, at the moment, I'm now at sort of at this point where all I want to do is experiment with yeah. things. So um, of course, things don't look the same as they did the last model because I'm experimenting with all these. Now that I've done this, I think oh, actually. Why am I limiting myself to painting that way when there's no rules? There's no rules to, to paint. You can paint, you know, experiment. So that's what I'm doing. But, you know, trying to expect the same results it, as I painted before is not going to happen. So, uh, but yeah, I, I, overall, I'm, I was really happy with that Harbinger. It came out really well. Yeah, it's awesome. great. Um, Sweet. Mm-hmm. As artists, we know how time-consuming painting miniatures is, especially if you want to achieve a high standard for tabletop or display. Life is busy, and we don't all have eight hours a day to paint. Plus, if you're still early in your painting journey, it may feel that you're a long way off ever owning your own beautiful army for your games. For 10 years, Siege Studios has been delivering bespoke miniature painting commissions to collectors and gamers all over the world. We have a world-class team of artists from Golden Demon winners to ex-studio painters, collating hundreds of years of collective experience. Here at Siege, we offer a series of painting levels and services to meet your needs and budget, whether you want a favorite character for your display or a stunning gaming army. We pride ourselves on offering well above the industry standard of quality and our customer experience. To see our gallery, learn more about our services and get a quote now, head over to siegestudios.co.uk or head to the link in this episode's description. Cool. Should we do some uh, a staple of the show, our listeners' comments? It's been a while. Mm. Uh, let's go through some of these here. Mr. Lee says, uh, the tanks on bases thing is tough. I put an orc truck on one of the newer buggy bases and it really set it off, but a rhino would look weird. I think it has a lot to do with negative space on a model and how much detail you can fit around it. So that's in relation to when we had Peach on the show. Uh, We were speaking about why tanks don't have bases always, although some of the new ones do confusingly, I guess, because they're flying. Because they hover hover there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, I sort of made the argument that you can kind of turn it into like sort of a mini diorama or something. I think it's quite a Depends fun idea. Depends what you want to do. I think for the most part, it's personal taste. I think if you're playing games and things, yeah, keep them off the bases. Um, just for, you know, easy, it's easier. If you've got terrain all over the places, maybe it's easier to place them down on the, on the on your gaming board and things. But if you're going to like make a, yeah. a bit of a diorama or whatever. I guess that's part of the issue because I don't play the games. I never really think about the consequences that yeah. some of those things would have. But yeah. I guess visually it, in, it intrigues me. Not, I don't mean in the sense of like making a massive diorama, but you can just mm. add like just a little bit. Yeah. Like I really love the the new uh, Cadian's got the filled ordnance battery and it's literally mm. just a little artillery cannon, but it's almost, it's not, it's not a diorama, but it's like got that diorama vibe because yeah. there's like, you could easily the carry on that theme. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. you've got the little guys on there loading the shells yeah. in. And you've got the guy like looking at the, yeah. the recon or whatever. It's it's quite cool. It's got like visual interest. Yeah. And there's um so you see that like within uh some of the larger vehicles as well. Like we've recently done some commissions for some some orc vehicles. Mm. And uh like the the kill rig is basically a like a Mad Max diorama <laughs> like going on, you know. Yeah. Um so I, I quite like that. I'd like the idea of if uh if I did have like a rhino or something, which is, let's be honest, quite a plain bland ish model having it on a on a little base where like maybe like oh, one of the tracks is coming off or there's like guy like 
mechanic working on it or maybe like uh even some uh some dead soldiers that get like run over by the tanks i think that's yeah quite cool. I, I, as much as i agree with everything you've just said it still for me just looks odd and i don't know why it is uh, it shouldn't it shouldn't do and i just want to categorically say that like do you think should... that's just because you're used to not seeing I th- them i yeah. genuinely think that's the reason why like, i yeah. genuinely think because i've known Rhino, Razorback, Predator, Land Raider, Vindicator. I've known all those tanks in Russia, all, all of them. I've known all of them to always never have a base. Yeah. The moment that I see, well, like I think I've mentioned in that episode, the first time I saw a Rhino on a base, I was like, what's that? What That just looks weird. Like, you know, I'm not disagreeing in the slightest. So I think that the base gives you, as you said, like the perfect opportunity to, to, to add create. Add a bit more story. I yeah, suppose, exactly. Yeah. Add, and that, you know, I, I, if, I love story when it comes to 40K. I think it's, it, it adds a massive amount of value to the miniatures. Um, and you've spoken before about how you love basing for I do, I do love basing, but I, there's something for me that when I see a tank on a base, it's really weird. Like, I, 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 this is why I think it's really confusing. And I don't actually think I've got to a point where I can understand why, other than it just looks odd to me because of what I've known for such a long time. Yeah. You, you, if, I, if I look at like a, a Gladiator, or if I look at a Repulse, or if I look at any of those tanks, and I see that, yeah, yeah it makes sense. Because I think since the moment I saw that tank, it's had yeah. a base. And yeah. I just, and I've just I've been like, oh yeah, it's, it's obviously it's flying, so it's, yeah. got fly, it's got a base, you know, have a base. Yeah. But for me, I don't know. It's really weird. I when you're not that I've played games in a long time, but when you're looking at your army on the table, obviously your infantry have bases, and that's just how they've always they've always had bases or whatever. But then when you just look at your tanks and they're just on the table, that's kind mm. of how they would look in real life. Does that make sense? But there's a continuity thing but here because like, I, I, there's I comment even mentions so like with the orcs, like with the newer orc buggies and stuff, they have the bases. And I painted a um, uh, orcs as a cult of speed, I think. Yeah. It, yeah. Uh, army. And they all, that was like all the newer stuff and it was the bikes mm. and everything was on a base and it just looked quite nice because yeah, everything, yeah. Like, yeah. everything had it's that consistent. uniformity. Yeah. But then you're talking about that that job with that kill rig in it recently. Like that had one of the, not the, the gargantuan, and it had the smaller squig off. That doesn't have a base. Yeah. So so you've got vehicles and stuff in that in that army that that and obviously there's got to be a base. line somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah there is. Know. Yeah. But yeah. then confusingly, knights have got a massive base. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but I suppose if you look at model making, even traditionally, most figures come on a base, and most tank model kits never have come on a base. Yeah. So yeah. you know maybe there's a bit of that involved. But I, I think I, I I don't know. Part of me would quite like to see a rhino. You know, smashing through some sort of barricade, barricade. You know, sandbags yeah. going everywhere. You know what? I'm I'm doing a Blood Angels army. I'll I'll lay this out. I'm going to give it a go. Yeah. If I forget any tanks, you madman. Put, <laughs> put, put tanks on base. I'll storm that beach. Yeah. 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 Like for me, for me, just I I don't know what it is. It's like because I suppose you you vision you're used to the silhouette of a model for X amount of years from looking at it. Mm. The moment that, that silhouette is changed, it's changed. It just, it just, no matter how, how, Let's break that mold. Exa- oh, no, yeah, Let's exactly. Break that mold. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's yeah. do another one. Uh, untitled name says lots of novice painters are quite insecure about their paint jobs in the local game store. They are hyped that it's painted or whatnot, but hesitant to show it off, or they make excuses for it as you're looking at it. This type of person needs more content made for them. They need to see mistakes and lower standards of paint jobs that Peachy presents, for example. It gives people confidence to get mm. better. I totally yeah. agree with that. I do. I do it. I do it when I when I, you know, James says, "Oh, you bring it in." I'm hesitant to bring things in that I painted because you know I just think, "Well, I'll bring it in," and then as soon as you're looking at it, I'll make start making excuses for, "Oh, I didn't paint that bit," or "I didn't have enough time," or this. I that think bit. that scales though because you say that, but we almost do the same thing to each other. Yeah. So like me and James are quite used to painting like display competition level stuff. Mm. But I know full well that when I show James stuff and when James shows me stuff, the first thing we do when we hand it to each other we is start, we start making excuses. Start making yeah. excuses, yeah. Why yeah. do we do that? Well, I think it's because you, because ultimately because you... I know we were wish, our own worst critics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That. But I think it's because you you wish that you'd either A, had the time or B, put the effort maybe into that specific part or, or for, for lack of time or whatever, blah, blah. Like I think, I think that's something that... You want to like diminish the mistakes almost yeah. by acknowledging them before they get a chance to, to see say them. them yeah. Which is stupid, don't yeah. get me wrong. But I feel like that's the thought process. Is like, but I don't in, want him to think I made a mistake. I want him to know that I know that that mistake's yeah. there so he doesn't think that yeah. I just so missed it. So he doesn't it. bring yeah. it up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you've, you've absolutely nailed yeah. it. That's exactly it. That is exactly it. Because you're like, oh, I know I should have done that. I just didn't. Or I didn't want to, you didn't have the time to do that. Or maybe that line isn't as straight as I know. It. I looked at that line when I drew it, when I put it on there and it's, it's yeah, I know I, I, should, I can and should have done it better. You know, yeah. uh, that's exactly it. Yeah. yeah. Funny little psychological game. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. Like, at the game store, 
if you, you know if you're taking your stuff to the game store for gaming and things like that, um, there's a there's a like anywhere else there's a bunch of knowledge there. Yeah, you know you can tap into that. No, hundred yeah. percent. I I, that, I, th I think that it, the what Peachy is doing with going back to him obviously being on the show last week. Like I think that having that almost like unfiltered kind of approach to to viewing mm. the process, I think it massively alleviates that sort of like well it's not normal to make mistakes like it's yeah it's perfectly normal yeah it's like, more representative of reality as well yeah, because like, is, yeah. the yeah. majority of people are casually consuming this stuff like mm. the the high-end painters represent the minority but they're almost making content for the majority but correct that's, that's yeah. not they're not on the same the yeah. same level of expectation I, I have to say with um like youtube tutorials i tend to find myself when i'm sort of watching them if I'm watching high-end painters like you know, like Richard Gray or people you know like like that, I don't tend to really take in too much of what they're saying. It's kind of a background thing, and it's quite nice to have that it playing in the background as I'm painting. Why is that? Is that because you you feel that you're because not able to because they're so high level? But I tend to sort of tune it out. Whereas because you know they're not painting for people like me. Whereas, like you say, with, with Peachy and um, you know some of the other YouTubers out there, where you know their paint jobs aren't quite golden demon, and they are they are catering for people like me who are, you know, they're not painting for competitions; they're, they're just painting to to, to, to yeah, learn yeah. the process, and they actually show you, look, well, I've made a mistake here, you know, and it's not just well. I've seen you make a mistake and then it just cuts and that mistake's gone. How do you repair that mistake? How do you get, and they sort of say, well, we made a mistake, but don't worry about it. I think worse than that is the not showing the mistake at yeah. all and kind of like hiding that they even happen. Yeah. Which is ridiculous. It's, I mean, the painting process, you have this, you know, ugly phase, I suppose, when at the start of when you're painting, you know, any model, you have this sort of phase. I always do. I always know that I do, but I, no, 100%. I know that, you know, I put the base colors down. I think it looks terrible. However, I know that at, at some point in the future, you know, a few hours time or whenever you get, it's all going to come together. But it's that process of starting, you know, in this ugly phase until it comes together that a lot, of, I think a, a lot of people struggle with because you can't see past that ugly phase to see, to know that, keep at it and it will come together i think that's a combination of the things we spoke about on other episodes and uh, you know, with other people like there, there's too much of an importance placed upon getting the it's progress perfect yeah or getting the progress and just you know especially like for wanting to contribute to to the anathema that is obviously instagram and social media and all that kind of stuff and putting updates up and all that kind of stuff like um i think that that's part of it as well like it's it's seeing the thing at the end of the process and going, that's what I'm going to achieve, you know, or what I want to get to, but then not not thinking about all the incremental steps which get you there and focus on each of those. If you focus on each of those individually, you'll get to the end. Hmm. Whereas like you say, obviously the ugly stage, and I agree with you, that's where obviously the model doesn't look anywhere near that end finished result. Whether, yeah. When you say ugly, it doesn't necessarily mean well painted or badly painted. It's no, it's about, just it's more about the, the, the process yeah. and the stage in the, in the painting. And, and I think too many people focus on that end goal rather than thinking well if i just block put it look put the red all over the model and then if i just block the black in and if i just shade it all the color that it needs to the soft shadow and then i do the deep shadow and then i do this for the first age highlight then i do if you focus incrementally on those steps the end of the process and the final thing almost happens yeah. it's more digestible happens, as well yeah. isn't it because even with like our own patreon tutorials or with content like peachy because it's that more methodic step by step of like if you do these steps in this order it will look like this whereas yeah. as you know if you're painting like more competition stuff or higher end display pieces there's a lot more like painting as you go kind of less repeatable like you're sort of doing micro blends on the yeah. palette uh, that you can't really account for them there's I've actually more... been quite defeated as well in the past like um you know you started I've started a model and I've not got past that sort of ugly ugly phase that sort of point because I just I, I can't see that end product sometimes it just on a model it just, I think, just think I see it I finish with that one I can't I can't see past this stage and so I ditch it and start something else 
Do you do so you uh, it's something to ask? I mean, do you when you when you start a new model that you've, maybe you've not painted before, like you were saying, you know, you said earlier, like I'll paint something and it won't, and I've painted in a certain way and a certain quality mm. for X amount of time, and then I'll try something new and it maybe I'm painting the same, but it doesn't reach yeah. the same. Do you think that's because because of not deconstructing? the end result working almost backwards and going yeah. well, that's what I want it to look like and then to get that I need to do this 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 do, do you think that's, yeah. that's because I, of that maybe, yeah or? because I, I'm looking at the the end goal rather than setting myself sm smaller achievable goals mm -hmm. to actually get there like the stepping stones to get yeah. to the you know the prize yeah. I, at the end one, one thing I, w I will just want to tack on to that is that like um, I also think uh, we're also saying about like seeing mistakes and seeing ish errors or seeing things that maybe don't go quite right and stuff like that. I do think it's very difficult and I just want to defend, uh, I say defend, but I do want to see it from the other side of the fence whereby when, when people are making those types of videos, be it, you know, super high end or mm -hmm. whether it be, you know, maybe kind of just like showing a process of painting a miniature or whatever. I think there is also maintaining the interest of that person watching it and sometimes yeah. those things can get put to the wayside because of it that's the difficulty of content in general is like you're also trying to make a video that people like and is want it entertaining to watch, or that whatever. is entertaining yeah. and a lot of people i mean i know this from fact from doing our own research and speaking to other people and from my own habits most people who watch tutorials aren't actually necessarily going to do that exact thing yeah. they yeah. want to watch that video for a level of entertainment and kind of like banking that information for a later date. Mm. I would say that there's a, quite a small minority of people that are actually searching for that specific video because they want, they've yeah. got that exact model and they want to paint that exact thing in that exact same color well, scheme. Well, when I first started painting, I, the, the way that I got in, like, was sort of learned to do it, I bought a VHS cassette tape from wow. the back of a wargaming magazine uh, for painting wargaming miniatures you know like little because that exists that's mental it existed yes yeah, so did really no no i i um, I, I grew up with vhs yeah like, you know, so I no i didn't know that there was like painting content in that format very very limited like uh, this was the only cassette that i could uh, the only like video on this process that i could find because youtube wasn't a thing then yeah. so we, i bought this videotape and I must have watched that videotape 50, 60 times to learn. And it was just this elderly gentleman sat at his bay window in his house uh -huh. painting this dwarf. And um, and it was just just one dwarf. That was it. And uh, it was 45 minutes, this cassette tape. And I must have watched that, like I say, tons of times. And it was it was so, I mean, people know when they've got VHS about the tracking, trying to get the tracking right. Because so it was almost unviewable by the time I... I'd imagine the resolution wasn't great either. Oh, it, well, you know, it was, yeah, I don't know. It was okay. It was all right to watch, but I, you know, but that got some kind of content. It, we, we're could so you actually lucky. see what you was learning? Because I filmed videos in 4K. Yeah, it wasn't and sometimes too bad. I think you can't see what's it going on. It wasn't too bad. It, it was a general idea, but I mean... We are very lucky these days. Yeah. Very yeah. lucky that there is so much content out there to learn well, from. Well, I, I said it last episode, I said it's like being drunk. You just see, yeah. it, you're just constantly absorbing all this stuff and it's there for you like every day because of the growth of the industry and because of the mm. growth of individuals making content like that and the increase of that. Um, there's, there's something new going up every day. Yeah. And that's like, on most occasions, I've, like it's multiple videos. It's not just one person. There, there are a lot of people putting up new videos, especially when you're following the meta of like releases like from yeah. manufacturers and that kind of stuff. Like you are drowned in videos, tutorials, content, yeah. step by steps. Like you are apps. Like I, I think someone coming into the future from 10, 15 years ago wouldn't know where to start. Yeah, being frank, they'd arrive and they'd be like, I, I like, where do I even begin? Mm -hmm. If we are naturally aware of it and naturally okay with it because it's had because it's how things are now and we've obviously grown with the industry as that's happened i think yeah i think if you had someone come from the past or we do a do a back to the future doc doc expose like if from it, the 90s yeah from the 90s <laughs> if they came forward it'd be like well where do i even start yeah you know? so well i'm glad you said that because that segues so perfectly <laughs> into our topic for this week <laughs> which is about the mistakes that self-taught mini painters make and number one on my list here is uh, consuming too much content in place of practicing. Yeah. So just to just to unpack this topic before we dive uh, into all of the specific points, this is basically mistakes that you might you might make if you're someone who is learning, like just from watching tuition online and you've not taken any. For example, we do like the painting classes with Siege in person and you've mm -hmm. not had 
or maybe you've been like painting or learning from a more experienced uh, friend who's getting you into the hobby and they can have some hands on time. Some of the little things that you're not necessarily going to know are, are mistakes or some things that I've personally experienced in the past that mm. I've overcome. Um, especially if you're someone who's self-taught and learning in this plethora of content online yeah. that James is referring to. Um, something which I massively suffered from early on. And I do this with a lot of things that I get interested in. So mm. I picked up my first uh, like Warhammer box because I got the idea when I was like walking past the Games Workshop store. I've told the story before. But I had that box and it was sat on my desk. And before I even opened it, I was like, I'm going to watch... <laughs> Dozens and dozens of hours on YouTube. I'm going to learn you do. everything. And I, I I have this naive like thought that I'm just going to learn it all first and then like do Neo the thing. You do, from the Matrix. Yeah, I, say, you do, you yeah. do, you do uh, you, uh, what's, I can't remember her name from the Matrix. That's going to really bug me now. I Trinity? Somehow, yeah, you do a Trinity before the helicopter scene where she just like gets all the information, <laughs> exactly. like, it downloads it and then she's like, I don't have to fly a helicopter. Yeah. yeah. Like, which, um, which, going to my point, is there is no replacement for actually practicing and Just doing, doing it, things yourself. Yeah. You can't learn how to swim from watching a YouTube video. Like it's not going to save you. Do you know? Well, what you I mean? can, but you might still, you might still, unfortunately, not be able to swim. Yeah. So it's but, get swimming lessons. Yeah. yeah, don't watch YouTube videos. Yeah, and I, that's not to say that you can't learn how to paint minis from no. watching videos online. You no. absolutely can. I've done it. Lots of lots of lots of lots of people have done it, and there is some amazing content out there. Some amazing mm. tutorials, and you can absolutely learn a lot from them but my personal experience there comes a time where you kind of start using those as a bit of a crutch of pr procrastination a crutch of procrastination mm, nice. and you start relying on watching those videos you're like oh i've got an hour to paint tonight yeah and you spend that hour to... watching videos or like 45 minutes yeah. watching videos rather than actually putting painting that repetition in, in. yeah I i'm going to throw something else into the mix that i that i am actually very guilty of um um uh, and I don't know whether it's a bad thing or whether it's a good thing, but I think it's something to just to talk about as a topic. Because I've not seen any anyone really talk about this before. Um, it's absorbing another style or way of actually painting. So I grew up loving heavy metal, right? I grew up loving it, eat, sleep, breathing it, as I always say. Um, that, That's heavy metal, the painting style, and not the heavy materials. Yeah, that I don't come just, I don't just go a random, <laughs> grab a random bit of like yeah. titanium just and start chewing on it or something. Like that. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Um, but nice no, hobby. what I mean is that like, so really, what's happened with my painting over the years is that that is kind of like what I've always painted as because like, or then or, or attempting to paint it as close to that as possible. Not saying I can paint it to that standard, but painting it as close to that as I physically can. Um, and I think one of the pities of that, of when you kind of absorb something that you see, is that you don't develop your own processes and your own ways of executing stuff. Um, I look at a lot of painters out there that that probably can paint an heavy metal style miniature, maybe not to the same refinement and quality as an heavy metal, heavy metal actual model, but in the same lieu of it. But they also paint in a style which is like signature to them. So you mentioned mm. Rich, for example, or the wizard, as I call him, like, Rich, Rich has got a very unique way of painting, his way of painting. You can look at a piece and go, I know that's Rich's uh, Rodrigo Accor. You can look at his miniatures and go, I know that's a Rodrigo Accor miniature. You can look at Mark Masklands, look at his busts and things that he paints and go, I know that's a Mark Masklands bust. You know, because they have their own in, in their own style of physically painting miniatures, yeah. if that makes sense. I think that's one of the things that for me, I'm a bit, I say gutted that like, because it's not really a negative or a positive. I don't really know how to explain it, but I wanted to talk about this as a specific topic or, 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 or on this episode or show because because I think it's something that maybe you, as a painter you should try and if you love a certain style there's nothing wrong with you doing that and trying to paint that way but at the same time try to be a bit more creative with your own way of painting because at the end of the day like we always say it is art just because it's on miniatures it's still a form of art and how how um how boring would it be if like mm. if uh Monet looked at a Picasso uh, and went, oh, I'm just going to paint like that. If you enjoy listening to these podcast episodes every single week, I'd like to ask that you could please do us one small, tiny favour in return and hit that subscribe button on YouTube or the follow button on your podcast app. It takes only two seconds and it really, really helps us out and it allows us to bring you these episodes for free every single week. Thank you so much. Back to the episode. That's yeah. funny, actually, because in, in fine art, everyone's trying to develop their own style and everyone's got this obsession with trying to be unique yeah. and have their own distinct look where people recognize their work just from yeah. looking at it visually. Mm. And yet it feels like, I'm sure there's plenty of people that do want their own style and that's fair enough, but 
it does feel like there's this gravitation to like, oh, there's this content creator that I really want to paint like, or there's this competition yeah, painter exactly. that I really want to paint like. Yeah. I want to make my stuff look exactly like them. Yeah. yeah. Or and they're chasing the box art. Yeah. yeah. Images. And, Which, I, and I'm super, you know, I, 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 say it, like, I am guilty as charged with that. Like I, I, I love it. You know, that's the way that I love painting. But I think that that's something that I've probably over the last, since doing this show and since chatting, obviously on, on paint perspective, like I think that's something that for me has always has, has started to be a bit more of a thing that I'm aware of. It's like, yeah, I love that. And I'll always love that. And I'll always try to try to paint like that, but maybe I should just get a model and just try and paint it in a way, which I feel is right for me. If that yeah, makes but sense. Don't like, you think you should, but that isn't that something that maybe develops after you've got, well, I mean, cause like Richard Gray, I mean, you could use his tutorials to learn to paint. Yeah. And then veer off and create your own style but, rather than just seeing him. Right. But, there's but, a difficulty though, when you've been painting a certain way for so long to try to and try branch and, out because it kind yeah. of becomes your style because that is how you paint. Yeah. Do you know what yeah. I mean? That's what I know. And there's, yeah. and there's also so many little things to it. Like, for example, like it just, and it's something we say about videos all the time, just because you're watching the video, you don't get the exact dilution your water in the area that you live might not behave be the same as the water in the area that that person lives in. So some people have got a lot of water that's got more, not chalk, but it's a bit more it's hard and soft, a bit water, hard and soft yeah. water. Like, and inadvertently those, those things do affect the way that paint behaves on a model and the way that dilution happens as well. Like, it, like painting isn't this non granular thing that like you just add water to the paint and it behaves like X. Like there's mm. so many little variables that, uh, you know, and that's before we come down to, using the brush uh, you know some people uh, use the brush a lot softer than others so that they're generating again it's something i always say on classes like i see lots of people when they're doing brush strokes and they're painting miniatures and they're putting a base coat in a model like this and they're slapping the paint on like this you don't visibly see it but you're yeah. creating loads of micro friction on that surface of that miniature which theoretically will give you a rougher finish than perhaps someone yeah. who puts it on in one pass that's smoother, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. With, where they've adjusted the pigmentation and dilution ratio so that they can do one smooth control pass, block that in with one control pass, creating less friction on the surface of the model. There's loads of little nuances in miniature painting that because we don't visibly see it, we don't think about it. Yeah, And I think that that's the real interesting thing. Like when you say like uh, about like box art, you know, one thing that I, I've got to take my hat off to, and it is a bit of a nod towards heavy metal, and I always say this, I know I look up to them and I know I've always enjoyed their painting, but that's one thing that, that has always been a bit of an anathema to me is that they have 20 plus painters in the in the main heavy metal team now. You've got the specialist games team, etc. But they do get their painting very, very, very at a micro level close to each other like they're the very consistent yeah. very consistent yeah. with each that's other. kind of by design of the style itself of course. Though, yeah. Isn't it? yeah and and also you have to take into consideration the internal training that goes into place obviously when they take someone on and being in that being uh, through osmosis being in that kind of environment but the real interesting thing for me is that is that like all these little things that we're talking about they do make massive tangible differences so just because you watch a, mm. a rich video or just because you watch a squidmar video or just because you watch whoever's video and you go i really like their painting style the choices and things that you then start making don't inherently lead to you painting exactly the same as that no. person. Well, it's also like the assumption that what that person is doing is correct, which is not to say that they're incorrect, but because it is art and everyone has their own way of doing yeah. things, it might be correct for them in that moment on that given model. It might not be correct for you in your skill set and your given model. Do you yeah. know what I mean? So yeah. like you kind of have this assumption that like, oh, I saw this in a tutorial and that's how they done it. So I'm supposed to do it like that. Yeah. yeah. But and I'm going to paint we, every model like the same way. Yeah. Forever. And like, I know, I'm sure James knows from doing the classes and I know from sitting down painting with other, other guys on the team is everyone has their own way of doing stuff. Mm. And I sit and have these conversations with James about like the electric drill, for example, which is funny <laughs> to joke about. But if you looked at our finished models, yeah. you wouldn't look at either of them and say that one of us had a bad drill barrel and one of us had a good drill barrel. You'll be, yeah. you'll be looking now. Yeah. <laughs> we will but, find the differences. Yeah. But everyone has their own way of getting there, don't yeah. they? So I guess like that's why I say at a certain level, like put down the content and practice yeah. and I, put those no, hours I agree in. totally. But I, I do find myself, I have to say, that on a Friday when I sit down to paint, the first thing I do it's like, you know, I set my iPad up next to my painting table and I, I scroll through YouTube content. I paint like the painters that I subscribe to for something to to watch or to have on the back in the background. 
And I, and you can, well, I think, well, actually, the time's ticking away, and I've not done anything yet because I'm focused on finding someone to absorb, someone to yeah. watch. Yeah, to so do it. That's why. That's why. That's why I've why I've always. I mean, I don't know why. It's not something I consciously made a decision to, but like for me. I don't watch anything while I yeah. play. It's it's all audio. I either put on an audio book or I put on a film score. Like the, the, I, I, podcasts I, I, fill that gap yeah. though, because I know a they lot do, of people yeah. listen to the show while yeah, they're no, like, no, I do. No, yeah, I do. Totally. Put, put, no, I mean on it's a Friday. It's, it, I do. Yeah. This this sort of whether you're watching it, or watching this show on YouTube, or whether you're listening to it on one of the myriad of different apps or, or platforms that we put it on, like or any other podcast or any other thing, like uh, something that's non-visual, I think mm. helps. There's this thing where like visual attention and almost situational attention are like i I, they they're separate totally like attention isn't just one thing in my mind like Mm. you can you can visually focus on something like if i'm sitting here now and i'm looking at the grain on this table it doesn't mean that i can't listen to something that's over there does that make sense Mm. like so i think that you can you can split your attention between multiple things and do two things at once etc but but for me it's it's the it's the blurring of visual and situation. It does depend but, on the visual. For example, like if you've got a podcast on, I like to watch watch podcasts yeah. while I'm painting. Yeah. yeah. But you know, it's like in this context, this guy's sitting having a chat. It's yeah. not like something that I need to divert exactly. my attention. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like if I yeah. was if I had a, a miniature on screen and I was talking about it and that's going to trigger you to look at the screen and then yeah. look at it, etc. Yeah. Blah blah. There's probably people listening now that have just looked at the screen. But <laughs> but, but, the, but the the point the point is is that like is that um is that I think that those two types of attention I think learning to separate those and not do the thing I'm sorry to call you out on it but like but put something on that isn't the visual yeah. will help you to then focus on the uh, on on the visual for yourself and go right okay well I'm doing this and you'll probably be able to start painting a lot quicker while just listening to the thing yeah I'm sure um, you do this as well Paul like I'll sit there because I do the same thing I literally have my iPad sat yeah. on my hobby desk. And I'll spend like 15 minutes trying to find like the perfect video for the yeah. background. Yeah. I've wasted all that time. Like you could have been yeah. painting. Yeah, yeah. even when I'm sort of mid painting, the, the video will finish. I put the paintbrush in my mouth, you know, yeah. like with the handle. So it's, you know, sideways. I've got paint on the end. So now I'm scrolling. You're on a time crunch now. I'm, and that's drying. <laughs> I've got yeah. paint drying on my yeah. brush. It's yeah. like, and then I go, I think, what am I doing? I, was like, I, 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 will get, I will happily and guiltily admit that I have killed a near brand new Kalinsky brush yeah, because yeah, so. I had my iPad there and I was painting and I stopped for a second to click on another video and I got distracted yeah. and it just literally dried out and <laughs> yeah. like beyond repair. Yeah, it's it's, like, it doesn't happen often, but I, I mean, I, I do do it. I'm guilty of doing that. I mean, on a Friday, I normally listen to obviously the, the Siege podcast. Um, paint perspective. Paint Paul. perspective, yeah. So I normally listen to that on a Friday. but And then and after that, it depends. I either go straight to the tutorials or even worse, I get Netflix on. <laughs> I mean, where you're compelled to watch. Now we're on a slippery slope. You know, yeah. and you're compelled to watch that. When you spend than, 15 uh, hours trying to decide on what to well, actually P- watch. Petri, yeah. on, Petri last week said that he, uh, on his ideal hobby day, he would have mm. something on uh, in the background like Lord of the Rings or the Hobbit movies. Yeah. And his whole thing for that was because he's seen them before and he well, doesn't have to that, look that's at them. That's the thing because you, it, that has almost become like the podcast whereby you just you just don't, exactly. need, to, you don't yeah. need to watch it because yeah. you know every scene, every I, word. I, I do mean, feel though... I. I can't just sit there in silence and paint. No, no, I, I agree. I have agree. to have some background noise. Oh, do you know, this is one of a bit 50-50 on it. Like there have been certain times when I've been painting something, uh, not just necessarily for competition, but there's mm. there's many t- occasions where I've just been like, I really need to focus on this. And like having that quietness and having nothing going on other than the, the absolute focus of the thing I'm doing has been really therapeutic as in like just not being distracted by yeah. anything at all whatsoever. I mean, um, it's the it's beyond the scope of this podcast because it's a painting podcast. But I will yeah. draw a comparison. Is um, I was listening to I think it was um, Andrew Huberman who was saying like being comfortable, being uncomfortable, and he was saying like, have you ever gone for like just a walk without putting headphones on and just mm. being alone with your own thoughts? And I tried applying that to painting. It similar to what James is saying. When I was painting for Golden Demon, I made a conscious decision to like have no distractions because I was really trying to put myself in the right headspace. Mm. And it's funny how you paint very very differently when you haven't got that because it's, it's still sucking away like 10 percent of your attention even if it's not like your full visual attention like that's still your brain is still trying to process what you're listening yeah. to and just having like full 100 percent of like your own independency in what you'll think and you're thinking about what you're doing more mm. consciously like yeah. you've got a bit more bandwidth to start yeah. thinking about okay i'm going to do this next and you can start like planning ahead and you yeah even though it's only a small amount of attention that you're winning back 
But it sounds like nothing, but it's still, it's still, your attention is still mitigated in some yeah. form. Like if like, I think the, the ultimate thing is like, let's just say hypothetically, you, you do, I, mean, I don't want to, there are a lot of people that, that watch this and listen to this that maybe aren't interested in competitions and I don't want to go down that rabbit hole for too long and bore people. But all I would say is that like, is if, if you really tried your hardest to enter for a competition and you can honestly sit there and say, I gave it a hundred percent. Hmm. does that include the, all the little distractions while you're painting yeah if 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 you're sitting there and you're going i gave it 100 percent, and i didn't have any distractions while i was doing that at all you can confidently sit back and go that's the best i can do yeah you know but if yeah. you've got if you've got random stuff going on and we've all got busy lives like don't get me wrong like i'm not sitting here like, like you know you know but saying that you can't have distractions but i think that when you get the opportunity to just completely zone in on a model and zone in 100 percent and give it absolutely categorically 100 percent hmm you will see better results. I think it's, it's subjective. I do think it's, I do think it's worth a go, but mm. I will acknowledge that this is entirely like personal preference and oh, it's yeah. down to you. Yeah. And I know that there's a lot of people who, especially if, particularly if you've got, um, if you're in a neurodivergent or you've got ADHD or something, you might struggle to concentrate without yeah, yeah. some other well, stimulus. I was just going to say, I don't, maybe my brain's wired differently, but I often find that I do concentrate better with some form of background, yeah, yeah. Yeah. background yeah. noise. Yeah. Whereas yeah. if I'm sort of sat in a room and it's, absolute silence i i can't i can't it seems odd to say but i can't no, but, seem to focus as well yeah. so no, but I, I need that i actually sort of need that i used to think that way as well and then i tried i, I do both now mm. basically i kind of have like two different modes almost i like to switch between but um i didn't think that i'd be able to do it and yeah i didn't think that it would really make a difference i thought i was just sort of making myself more bored for the sake of it but i don't think that that's reality i do think it did help but yeah. that's just me um should we move on to some some more of these. Uh, next one I've got on my list is going broad instead of narrow, uh, trying a range of techniques without mastering the fundamentals. Mm. Um, yeah. This is something that, again, in my uh, escapades as a young painter of trying to consume all the content in the world and download the information into my brain as if that was going to make me any good. Yeah. Uh, like, oh, you hear all these like keywords when you're new, yeah. like, oh, edge highlighting, wet blending, glazing. You feel like, okay, I need to know all of these. When in reality, especially if you have like a particular style that you like to paint, you're probably only going to be using of a, a range of say twenty techniques. You're probably going to use like five of them. Or yeah, even it's picking out what's important amongst all the techniques. That and you're there are some with. that aren't going to cross over. For example, thinning your paints and knowing how to put down a nice yeah. smooth base coat mm. is going to apply to literally every single style that you're going to paint. Mm. Whereas you might paint a model without ever glazing once. You could paint armies and armies without ever glazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. I I think that it is important to get to get a broad knowledge of how to execute painting um, before mastering stuff. I think that you've kind of got to go through that process to find what works for you, to find what you enjoy. And this is before we even talk about the situation. Like as we said, if you're trying to get your models on the table really quick, you're not going to be glazing. You know, there's no point you learning glazing. Like because mm. being frank, like you better off it, it, dry like, brushing. <laughs> it, wanna... it's, well, it's diff difficult as well of like assumed knowledge because you almost don't know what you're meant to know. And which techniques yeah. are critical, which I do yeah. completely understand. For, you know, for a very beginner to the hobby, it's like, well, what actually do I need to know to have a painted miniature at the end of a couple of hours of sitting there with my first set of stuff? Sorry to segue, but this is where I think stuff like, for example, like contrasts, uh, paints do come in so handy. And it, it ties back right back to the other episode, your first episode uh, or, or debut episode, if you want to call it anything, <laughs> um, you know, on here is that when we spoke about those, like, I think that that's one of the things that that, that kind of mitigates and that 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 necessity to learn specific techniques and stuff because ultimately those paints are designed for you to spray the model a color, put them on, and it does a lot of the work for you with shadows and highlights and etc. and all that kind of stuff. And it and it and not only that, you just get it out the pot and you put it on the model. Yeah, you haven't got to do yeah, any you middle worry steps. Too much. Yeah, yeah. yeah, unless you do put contrast medium and stuff into it or whatever. Blah blah. But 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 that's one of the real. I think in virtues of that as a, as a product and also just, just to get you doing ultimately, which is a thing where it is the first step on the ladder, which is mm -hmm. just getting paint on the model, you know? Um, and once you start that process, you then start, because what will happen is again, within that range of paints, there are some that are thicker than others, some that are dark, that, that give more contrast than others, some that, that maybe don't affect the model as much. I know if I use apothecary white and if I used, um, uh, the, the the black one whatever it's called um the contrast the black contrast paint called oh upon, it's uh, black templar isn't it it's black yeah. templar yeah if you're using apothecary white or black templar they perform massively different in the mat in the way they work on the model if that makes sense you know and they're both contrast paints yeah. from the same range 
Um, it's when you start using different paints within that range, as an example, that certain things start becoming, oh, maybe that's a little bit thicker on that model. What can I do to make that a bit thinner? Well, there's this thing called a thing called contrast medium. If I put some of that into it, you know, yeah. and that's the that's where you start going from the first step on the ladder to the next step on the ladder and so on and so forth. Yeah. And that's kind of how your journey begins yeah. because you're like, you start almost naturally noticing these little things which make you then go down these different avenues of like, right, well, I need to, I need to, I need to work, find out how to do that because that's going to make that not be a problem It's like anymore. finding the yeah. problems that you need to solve and then learning the technique for that kind of yeah. as you go, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. I think that goes back to like what I was saying about putting the hours in and putting the practice in, especially critically those first uh, few models even, like when you haven't painted at all. Like you kind of need to just get your feet wet before you can actually yeah. start to figure out what mm -hmm. are these problems that I need to solve and what are these techniques that I need to learn. You need to actually start like putting the paint down so you know what problems it is you're looking to solve and then researching how to go about doing that. He's just getting a feel for actually the painting process. He's I, putting the paint on the model. He's just getting a feel for how the brush feels and how it actually feels to paint something mm -hmm. rather than just, you know, sitting there listening to or, you know, having it all these discussions about it you've got to actually do it i think that's always really nicely back around to what you were saying before about like you know you can sit there and watch five thousand videos <laughs> on how to paint models yeah that's not going to give you the sensation or the, the no, control of the brush to, or it's not going to it's not going to start teaching you any of those things like what what he's going to teach you is getting paint out putting it on the model and actually learning from the experience yeah, yeah. of applying paint. watch the video learn the technique and then like you said was it putting into practice what was yeah, it yeah i, I yeah. can understand like there, there is some anxiety about around it because obviously expectation doesn't always meet reality reality mm. and there like, is that fear as well of like the models are expensive and you don't want to ruin yeah them. Put a lot of time into but this it. is this was like i'm not being funny if you're going out and buying a brand new i'm going to pull it an avatar of kane you know uh, you know or, or, a, a, you know, or angron <laughs> yeah. or your mortality like if you're buying a model like that and it's the first model you're painting there's nothing inherently wrong with maybe you starting with that model but i would i wouldn't set my Everest of expectation to be, well, that's the box art. I'm going to try and do that as my yeah. first. Like that, I think without any kind of guidance or not even guidance without any kind of self ex, self exposure to putting, minute, putting paint on a miniature, you're not, you're not going to, now you could, I mean, I'm saying this, but you could, there could be someone out there that got Angron or Mortarian for the first time and, and literally got all the paints because it's on the back of the box or got all the paints that suggested in some tutorial and just yeah. went yeah. ham and, and, and managed to get it 80% close. I mean, that'd be incredible if that's the case and hats off to you if you do that. But I think the vast majority of people that do have the apprehension, that do have the anxiety, that do think this model costs so much money or this costs X amount of pounds mm -hmm. or whatever, or whatever currency you, you obviously have, you know, um, I think that barrier makes it a lot less realistic you expecting to get it like that. And I think the thing that I would always advocate to anybody is like, if you just buy it, go on eBay, buy a couple of cheap models. Yeah. That, or if you've bought an army, like just focus on the the less important ones. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. there's going to be some, you know, smaller, yeah. lesser models, and not your centerpiece characters. Yeah. Um, I think that scales though what you're saying as well, because I don't think that's necessarily even a beginner focus thing. So, like for example, I am not great at painting non-metallic metal because I've barely done any of it, and I set the challenge for myself of when uh, preparing a competition piece that I'm doing at the moment, uh, a night relic that I'm doing, Stormcast model. Mm. I said, okay, I'm going to use this as a excuse to try and practice some of that skill. But rather than like James said, setting myself for the Everest of I'm going to do this full NMM model and it's going to look like Rich Grays and I'm going to win all these competitions as a ridiculous task. I've said, okay, I would like, uh, there's a little bit of trim on the cloth that I would like to do in a non-metallic metal finish. And I'm going to paint that and I'm going to practice that. And then on the next model, maybe I'll scale that up and yeah, do a bigger do piece a of extra, fabric. Yeah. Or maybe I'll do, then after that will be another model where, mm. okay, it's got some metallic armor, but it's not like fully armored. And then you yeah. start working your way up those up that ladder, like you said. Yeah. yeah. And, I th and I've got to say this just to tack onto that, like, because you've got, we all, I always, one thing I'm really conscious we do discuss and do talk about on here is just everyone's different approaches or to use the show's name, the different perspectives on actually painting miniatures. Like, that might be one way to start the way that George has ex is explained, but another way might be to go go ham and just grab a model and just grab the relevant colors for gold, silver, bronze, copper, whatever metallic you want to do in, in non-metallic metal and, and practice the blending and the light placement, all of that on a big object. But I still wouldn't set your goal of I'm getting every single part of that model perfectly exactly. blended mm. and perfectly lit. I'd go, well, I'm going to sketch all the colors on, get it roughly how I think it should look, but then I'm going to focus just on the shoulder pad 
and I'm going to try and get the shoulder pad as as I think that's a perfectly valid way to approach it. I have no like uh, yeah. apprehension for anyone wanting to just you know dive yeah. in deep and give it a go, but have the expectations that it's not going to be perfect on the yeah. first yeah. try yeah. and not yeah. be too disheartened by that fact. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's just yeah. I mean, I mean, we always say this, like, uh, but I, I'm again. It's through experience and through years, obviously painting, and, and I'm sure anyone who's watching this has been painting for a long time will agree. Like, if if I could go back to myself at a young age and go, I know at the moment you look at your models and you hate them, mm. but this is where you'll get to, you'll get better, yeah, or you'll get to, or yeah. this is an example of where you'll be at in five years. That if they, if they, if someone could almost again, to, Doc from Back to the Future could come back and go, hey, Marty, no, uh, if someone could come, <laughs> if someone could go back and go, James, like you know, um, this is kind of like where you're at now but don't be disheartened by that because if you keep practicing that thing that you're doing you will get to this point and look yeah. at what you've done do you know what I mean like that would be amazing for everybody if you could do that that's obviously not reality but I think the thing to flip that with is by going right well repetition's a mother of success if I do this five times the fifth time will be better than the first time yeah. and having that confidence again to chat the acronym that I always use fear false expectations of hearing real your, your false expectations of what something is going to be you're not going to know what it's like until you've actually done it yeah. You know, and then done it again and again and again. I've learned from those previous, previous, yeah. that's going to conquer that fear that you're experiencing. And ultimately, when you apply that process or technique or that, 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 that color, color way onto another miniature or onto another part of your army or, or, or whatever it is you're doing, you have a much better starting point and trampoline to progress and do better on the next piece. And that's something that I think that all of us need to just take a step back sometimes and, and realize that in that moment, what we've painted and what we've done isn't going to be the best of our ability because we will constantly be progressing as we push harder. Yeah. You know? and, that, and that's something that I'd yeah. always say. Mm -hmm. So yeah. We frequently hear from you with questions asking how you can paint like our team of world-class and award-winning artists. Teaching is something that all of the team here at Siege are very passionate about. And we want to share with you the methods and techniques that we use to paint every single day all of the incredible miniatures and armies that you have seen from us. With the Seed Studios Patreon, you'll gain access to a growing catalogue of over 300 step-by-step -step tutorials covering a huge variety of colour schemes, miniatures, painting styles and techniques, from beginner-focused foundation tutorials to full character masterclasses. Each lesson comes in a beautifully designed and easy-to-follow PDF format with accompanying artist commentary with new tutorials added every single week. Your subscription also includes access to our private patron channels on Discord so that you can interact directly with our artists asking for questions or feedback. You'll also be supporting the podcast directly, helping us to bring you these episodes every single week. So if you want to take your painting to the next level and make the most of your very valuable hobby time, head over to patreon.com forward slash siege studios. Uh, next one I've got on here, this actually kind of ties nicely in with what you're saying about your harbinger, Paul, uh, mm. which is the idea of the different approaches to painting of if you want to improve, not necessarily treating painting in the same way as I want to get the job done. So there's this massive obsession with speed in the hobby, understandably, and that has naturally led to styles that incorporate a lot of shortcuts to get mm. things done faster. But I've, you know, I'm proposing this idea that is that necessarily going to improve your skill overall in the broader sense? So you were talking about how before when you was painting, you was doing it a, a bit faster and, you know, using the contrast paints and things like that. But now you're looking at painting to a higher level. You're kind of having to treat the mindset completely differently in yeah. your approach to getting those and, and to dial mm. those techniques in. You're kind of not starting from square one because you've obviously got the brush control and the repetition from practicing. And I'm not discrediting that you can't learn how to paint by doing that. But when you start looking at wanting to take the next steps, there's kind of this new approach to painting that I think you've got to take. Yeah, it, I, I think it kind of depends. If you're an army painter, then there's a kind of a difference. I don't particularly, I don't collect an army. So I've got the luxury of just picking any model that I like the look of and spending as long as I want painting it. Um, if you're painting an army, you know, you want to, I, I assume that most people that collect an army want to actually game with that army at some point to, you know, and have it painted. So I suppose you've got, there's kind of two different painted techniques maybe that you use for your characters and all your fodder kind of <laughs> troops, you know? Um, so where speed painting might come in handy for all your, all your rank and file, you have got, but then you've got to learn two different techniques, perhaps one for 
your fodder and one for your characters. Yeah. And there's definitely a skill in that, like, you know, getting things to look really, really good in lesser amount of time. There's definitely a skill there element is, yeah. in there within But that. I think that, again, that will come the more you do it. The more yeah. you practice these things, the more they become, I don't want to say sex, sort of second nature. Muscle memory. But you'll, be, you'll become more proficient at yeah. them and you'll just, I think naturally you'll just become quicker anyway. Well, I, I always think the goal sh should be, in my personal opinion, to be fast at neat, sharp, smooth, refined. If you can, they, they seem like two opposite, it seems like an oxymoron, like they're, they're different ends mm. of the scale, but they're really not. Because like, if you get good at blocking in colors efficiently and smoothly and you learn dilution, learn your paint and learn all those things, like it, all of that harmonizes and allows you to actually paint models more efficiently. That's before, like, because painting process is one thing, painting quality is another thing and time investment is another thing. They're all, they're three, th they're three things and there's multiple other things that are involved within painting miniatures. Yeah. But, but for me, whenever I talk to anybody about, I want to be, I want to be better as a painter, but I also want to be quicker. Like, that sounds like it's an impossibility, but it but it really isn't. It's a case of just working your process, knowing your process, knowing the approach to painting the models, making informed choices from experience of paint and et cetera, and all those other things. And at the same time, the thing that you do need to do is put the hours in, get at the speed that you're at, because what happens is that you will get quicker through doing it more and more and more and more. So it will get to a point whereby if someone says to you, we'll block in that pouch, you'll be way quicker than the first time yeah. you've done it. You know, and yeah. I think that, I think that, Training yourself and learning to be fast whilst retaining the speed, uh, whilst retaining the quality, is that the best happy medium that you can go for? Because then you're constantly working both sides of the fence. Yeah. You know, I think where um, I was coming up when writing this point was the mindset of speed painting is cutting out all the little things that you don't need to be doing. And I've said on previous episodes mm -hmm. about how it's those little details that do make the difference. Mm -hmm. So if you approach your painting with Okay, I'm going to do. The, I'm going to shortcut this because that doesn't really matter, and that's going to waste time, and you're not really yeah. going to notice it anyway. But all those little things do add up, and I think if you're looking at other people's models and you're saying, "Oh, why, why don't mine look like that?" But then you're sitting down to paint and you're treating it like you're batch painting a yeah. big army, and I don't want to, you know, paint all the ribbing in between the armor, and I don't want to give it four hours because it's going to take a load of time. I completely understand that, but having this like weird expectation of I want it to look like this, and then I sit down to paint and, it and I'm rushing through it. Yeah. And I really struggled when I was learning to paint of. I was hearing all these higher end painters talking about how long it took them to paint a model. Mm. And I remember sitting down one weekend and being like, I'm just going to take as long as it takes. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to really, really methodically paint this model. And I'm going to paint really slowly. Mm. And then I painted a space marine in like two hours, which to me now with someone who might spend like 20 hours painting a marine is lunacy. Mm. But I, I was shortcutting stuff still. I was focused on painting neatly and sharply, like James said, and the model looked nice, but there shopping. wasn't that attention to detail. I didn't paint all the little buttons. I didn't add a, a highlight and a shade and to every single little individual detail. So I had this expectation of like, oh, I really want it to look like this. Yeah. And I sit down to paint and I go, well, I'm painting neat and I'm taking my time. So why does it look like that? Mm. But, but then you're still shortcutting. It's perfectly good for a game. Exactly. You don't, <laughs> it's perfectly good for... I think it's a perfectly valid way to paint in general. Like I'm not discrediting that at all. And there's certainly, it's certainly absolutely fine to do that. And you can yeah. have some amazing looking armies by doing that. But sitting for, for me in my experience when I was sitting down trying to go okay I really want to push my skill yeah. but then wasn't really following through on that the whole I way I think that's why when I sort of got back into it and I, I used the speed paints as a, as a sort of stepping stone to get back into things you know yeah, getting yeah. your muscle memory back or what you want to call it um, I, I very quickly decided that I wanted to sort of move on from just using the speed paints so I mean obviously I'd paint them in the speed paints and it would be, be great but then I thought, well, actually, now I want to add the gold trim. I want to add, I want to, I, I basically use the speed paints more as a base cut, as, yeah. a, as a basing sort of medium for adding things on top of. Mm -hmm. So that I could, I could, especially for like a Death Guard and things like that, that I was painting, I, I could put my main color on, forget about it. And then I could spend the time on all the little bits and pieces. I think mostly because. I wasn't I wasn't any good at ever uh, edge highlighting and doing that sort of highlighting. So the speed paints kind of did that for oh, you. Yeah. So then that means I could spend the time on things that I did enjoy doing, like the pouches, the weapons, the trim, and you know the bones and the and the, the intestines that are hanging out of all the marines and <laughs> things like that. So, but then obviously, <laughs> see it's a slippery slope because once you start learning to do a new little technique, you think uh, I might learn to do something else as well. And then the, the time adds on. So then you're not kind of 
painting quickly anymore. No. You're painting, it's taken a lot longer because I, I don't do patch, batch painting. I've never enjoyed bat, batch painting. I did paint seven plague marines uh, when I got back into it and I found the process torturous. I didn't enjoy it. Um, they didn't look as well as I wanted them to at the end of it because by you know, by the time I was doing 15, uh, seven shoulder pads, I just lost interest in doing it. So I always paint one at a time, no matter what it is. So uh, I, <laughs> even like your, your rank and file, I always ended up paint spending way too long mm -hmm. on those miniatures. And then, the, and then the character models that you did didn't seem to stand out. Uh, it's almost like what, what Peachy was saying. It was like, it's more about the, the spectacle of the yeah. whole army rather than the individual. Yeah. And it's almost like the character is the spectacle and that's why it does get the attention I see. at the time it does. But then... I find it difficult to do that. No, no, then I, I think that. <laughs> I pick up, pick up a rank and file and I think, oh, it just doesn't look that good to me. But from four feet away on the table, it looks absolutely fine. Yeah. I suppose a way you could do that as well is like, if you do have a ceiling of capability of painting, yeah. doing that on the characters and then intentionally stripping away some of the things that you are capable of doing on those other miniatures so that the character For stands out even sake. more. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, t t t yeah, good idea. Okay. Um, so, but sometimes my brain just won't allow that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my next uh, point on this list is something which is uh, quite near and dear to me, which is learning to critique your own models and yeah. learning from Ooh. other people. Yeah. yeah. But in a visual sense and, you know, going theirs is better than mine, but not mm. analyzing why. why it something is, that yeah. I really, really doubled down on early on and I do really think it was really, really pivotal and important for my painting was just spending time getting up like competition photos or people's Instagram pages on my computer on a big screen and just sitting there and actually looking at someone's work for more than 10 seconds when you're doom scrolling on Instagram. Yeah. yeah. Because it's so easy to look at something at face value and be like, oh, that looks amazing. And then you start like picking into it and you go like, oh, well, actually I would have probably done that a bit better. Yeah. And you start like picking things apart. And as well as that, on the other end, looking at stuff that is amazing and trying to work out why, like mm. sitting there and zooming in a model and going, oh, well, actually they use like these colors to highlight that. I probably wouldn't have thought of that. Yeah. I probably would have used, yeah. you know, I probably would have added white into my mix, but they've added, it looks like a little bit of yellow. It's quite a warm, yeah. warm style. Like, and once you learn how to do that by looking at other people's stuff, you can start to do it with your own models and you can start to work out what your weak points are yeah. so that you can improve those and focus on the things that you know, you're not good at that are going to see those improvements. I think we, everyone's definitely their own worst critic. Yeah. And I think we already touched on it where you say like, well, if I bring my modeling to show you, I immediately make excuses for why certain things that yeah. I'm unhappy with to, you know, pointing out to you that I'm unhappy with it mm -hmm. so that you don't point that out to me. Yeah. yeah. So, but uh, going deeper than that, like it's so, it's so useless to just sit in your model and go, I don't like it. It's yeah. not good enough. Yeah. Why? Like, yeah. <laughs> Okay, okay. Yeah. I, I don't like the, the this color choice that I used. Okay, well, let's go further into that. Yeah. Like, why did you pick those colors? What was the thought, thought um, process behind that? What would or, work better? Okay, you did use those colors. What could you have done to sharpen up your highlights that would have made that look neater? So and maybe it actually wasn't the colors that you used. Yeah. It was actually the execution of that. Maybe the color was nice, but the wash you put over it wasn't, wasn't appropriate yeah. for yeah. that color. Like, actually... Maybe even like just sitting with a notepad and looking at your model, making an actual list of things. Yeah. And then in an ideal world doing another one, implementing all of those points that you yeah. pointed out on the previous one. I mean, that's something we've spoken about before, isn't it? About getting a, a box of models and working through them one by one and analyzing them. But I think a really good way to approach that is by looking at work that you do love and not only working out why you love it, but maybe even find some things that you, you yeah. don't like about it or maybe aren't to your personal taste. So that mm. if I was painting that model, what would I have done? Yeah. yeah. Or just sort of saying to yourself, well, well okay. Pick, what three things do I love about it and what three things should I work on for my next one? Yeah. Maybe make like you make a little list, but I, I I'm doing like making lists and things is I'm doing that more now anyway, I yeah. find, especially like, when you go back a little bit to speed painting and things, uh, actually writing down what I'm doing in the first place mm -hmm. and then using that as a reference for the next one, which obviously, especially if you're painting one good. model, out of a squad at a time yeah. you want that to look the same yeah. if, you're, if you've got inconsistencies <laughs> of choice in that process but I, I like for critiquing other people's work and things it's like uh, every time Adam shows me anything in the room next door I mean it's all his stuff's always next level anyway mm. but I mean there's I always have so many questions for him 
and I would say, well, how do you, how do you do that? Because I look at it and think, I can't tell how you did that. It's so difficult. how do you, how did you do that? It's difficult. You know? you gotta, you gotta, he's so good. He's so patient with me. It, but. It, it's, it's, it, when you're looking at other people's stuff and you're looking at stuff like you're saying on the mm. big screen or whatever, I always say this, but painting miniatures and painting in general, like when you look at art in a gallery or like it's, it's almost like another language. You're, mm. le you're learning that language of the way the person has applied the paint or has made mm. the decisions that they've done. Like, and and the, the thing that makes it really difficult is it's not like actual languages like learning Spanish or learning a different like, yeah. language. Yeah. Because you might have regional dialects of that, of that language, but when, it trans when you translate that to miniature painting, every single painter has a different way or approach. So it's almost like that regional dialect of yeah. miniature painting is magnified exponentially. So understanding that from day one, I think is really important because you might look at two miniatures painted very similarly in execution, but the, the way and the choices and the things that the individual painters have chosen to get to that result can be leagues apart. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really important to take note and obviously to just to be conscious of because they might be given, we always say this, but you might give, give two painters very similar sets of paints as in mm. like his 30 paints that are the same as this person's 30 paints. You've both got to paint an ultramarine. You've both got to paint X faction, insert here, model, whatever, blah, yeah. blah. Both of their approaches will, will be massively different. And I think that understanding that is really, really important. But what, even if you don't have the language to necessarily like articulate that, if, especially if you're early on in your journey, if you look at their model and you can't, you, you might not necessarily have the words or the, the visual understanding yeah. to know what, what it is specifically, but at least acknowledging that and pointing out, making a note of it, start to put you on the path to understanding that. Yes, yeah. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I yeah. think as well, it, especially early on when you're getting, you know, you haven't been painting long and things, it, I think you should also not just critique your model in a negative way. I'm so glad you, are, because, you said that. Um, you can, especially early on when your expectation is this and, you know, you, you're left with something that is not, doesn't quite meet that expectation. And you look and you think, I hate it. It looks terrible. Part of that process is fine because you need that to prepare Spare yourself you off. To, yeah. to to be get better. But you, you should also sort of look at it and think, well, actually, th there are quite a few negatives here, but the positives that I can get from those negatives in, in moving forward, that's got to be something worth sort of keeping for yourself as well. Yeah, it is. And I, like, I, I think understanding the mistakes you've made, understanding the errors you've made, you know, and, and I don't want to use the word failure because I, I hate that word for the strength of, of, of impact that it has. But those, those issues that you, you find on miniatures that you painted, they are those, those mistakes, those, 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 those failures that you've mm. achieved or whatever, blah, blah. That's what teaches you to, to paint better moving forward. But I'm so glad you brought up about feedback because it's a part of, this whole industry and what I have to do for a lot of the things I do at Siege now, like that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, talking to painters, talking to looking at portfolios, looking at all those kind of things. Like feedback is something that over the years from my personal experience, it's always been given in a way that's very direct and linear. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that is it's like you just get, get told these things from the perspective of that person viewing it, but they're never separated at the point of delivery into factual or opinionated, Yeah, which is how I've always tried to give feedback to anybody that's ever asked it from me. And I'm a painter of a very mid area in the grand scheme of things compared to a lot of the painters that are in the industry. Um, but what I, what I would definitely, definitely say is that, um, is that separating it into those two, two specific columns, adds so much wealth hmm. to the person receiving it. Just giving a very linear approach to feedback, it's almost like vomiting just information at yeah. the person. And like they're like, oh, what, what the hell do yeah. I do? Like, you know, and I understand that totally, which is why when I, whenever I do give it and whenever I do talk to people, I always say, right, so I'm going to talk to you about the factual stuff first of all. There's a mold line there. Hmm. I can see a join in the model there. I can see you haven't drilled the barrel with a drill. Uh, I can see that. <laughs> I can see that. It, I can see that you've you've there's a you've tried to do some blending there on that sword where the blending is. There's there's a watermark here that's quite stark, or you know you've not blended between the mid to the light very well because there's quite a few like tide marks in there or join lines, or you've not glazed that enough. Or mm. that. that 
all of that, f- when you deliver it in a way and you say it's factual because it's on the model, it's there, you've done it, you can't argue with it. It's not like I'm going, there's a mold line there. No, there's not. Well, there's yeah. a mold line there. Yeah. You know, you can't argue with that. Um, that gives you some clear things to go, right, well, on the next one I do, I'm not going to do any of those things. Yeah. Mm. When it comes to the opinionated column, which is what I'll always do secondary, because I think the factual stuff is always important that you deliver that first to somebody. The opinionated is, okay, so it's a red model. You've painted a... A blood angel. Oh, I didn't say it, but it is. <laughs> a red right, model. Okay. That's what you're you're getting at. It right? could be a dragon. It know. could be the Genesis chapter. It could be a Genesis chapter. <laughs> it could, yeah, it could right, be. All right, well, it could be. Okay, yeah, let's could. just change it then. Yeah. You've painted a green model. There you go. Right, okay. okay so cool. you've painted... <laughs> I can't win. I can't win. I can't win. Right, okay. I've painted, painted an paint, ultramarine. No, no, no. <laughs> screw you all. You've painted a yellow model. There oh, you go. All right, okay. Imperial fist. There we go. Right, so you painted a yellow... It's the helmet on his <laughs> assault squad of blood angels. <laughs> <laughs> I literally cannot win. Um, so you painted a yellow model or object of model. Um, uh, and and like you've chosen X color for the, for the lenses or for the gems or for whatever. Okay. There's nothing wrong with that color. You can choose because of art, because of, you know, all that you can make whatever choices you want on the model, blah, blah. But... I personally would have done it in this color. All right, okay. It's not law accurate. No, it's, not even down to, it's not even down <laughs> it's to not law. It's not even down to law. Angel. A, it's not even down to law. I get what you're saying though. Like you've, you've got the like, you've got the things that are more opinionated. So yeah. I didn't like that color choice personally. I think it would have had more contrast if you chosen this other color. Yeah. However, that's mm. my opinion on it. Someone might disagree. Yeah. Someone yeah, might exactly. agree. But technically, yeah. it's, it's very good. Yeah, but but, uh, but what you've done yeah. with the color you've applied on mm. there is really good. Like you could have a perfectly blended yeah. perfectly blended sword or cape or, you know, uh, a flesh that's done really well, or whatever, it's smooth, mm. it's, you know, it's got nice tonal variants on it, but maybe maybe the cue isn't quite correct for the for the sword or for the cape or that. like that's that's more, but I think that when you separate it into those two two specific columns of information that you're giving to somebody, I think that the process of analysing that upon as a receiver, it just gives you a much better starting point for the next time you approach a model, either that's the same or you're going to apply something. You go, okay, well, what factually is wrong with that model that I can't argue with? Okay, it's all these things. Mm. I'll sort those out. So that column is ticked. Then you look at the opinion and go, right, well, well. Uh, I they liked purple for that, but I, I've chosen I've chosen this color, whatever. Mm, blah, blah, yeah. blah. But that's just your choice. Whether and it's at that point where you go, okay, well, that person's opinion. Do I do I want to agree with that, or do I want to try it and see if I agree with that thing? Or yeah. like, you know, this does tie into what I said as well because I think even when you're analyzing your own stuff, you can still put it into those two categories. Because if you're you analyzing your own work and you're trying to work out, okay, what is what is it that I need to improve? Obviously, you're gonna have a bias of your own opinions and it's the model that you painted understandably but trying to separate that like you said okay there's a mold line there I can put that in my own category of that's a factual yeah. thing versus that say I didn't like this colour choice that I used or yeah. I thought that this highlight wasn't sharp enough is that an objective thing or is that a yeah. factual yeah. thing big news tickets are now on sale for the Siege Studios painting classes for 2024 for over eight years, we've been running in-depth, hands-on classes across the UK, which has allowed us to create the perfect learning environment for improving your painting skills. With a variety of topics available, all our courses are taught by senior artists and feature practical demonstrations in a relaxed environment that welcomes interaction from you, discussions on theory, and an open Q&A session so you can ask that burning question you've had on your mind. You can even bring your models for feedback. To book now and reserve your place before tickets set out, head over to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop. I'll see you on a class soon. I know someone that got feedback uh, after a model that he put like 40, 50 hours into and the feedback was, I just don't like the model. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like, how is, how is that going to, how is that help going anyone. to help the person <laughs> to, to, yeah. to progress as a painter? And or you can also make- massively discredit that because it's like, okay, well, he didn't like that model. I could have, asked for the same feedback from a different person got a completely different answer because yes, they yes. did like the model. Do you know what I mean? And it's just like that does not help that person at all. So that you've got to th- from a person when you get asked for feedback and this is the other thing I want to flip it on the other side of the table as well like when someone asks you for feedback they're either asking you because A they're a friend and they just want some friendly advice from someone that they ultimately respect their opinion yeah. of you know or B you're someone that they feel is a better painter than them so they're coming to you for assistance and help so what you tell them is gonna is gonna either aid or or mitigate and and make the process harder for them on their painting on their journey of painting. It's a hugely humbling thing to have someone come to you and go, "I really want you to give me some feedback on the model." Yeah. Like so, 
So if you're if you're receiving those kind of questions or if you're getting someone asking you about getting feedback, then I think honestly the best thing to do is just think like, what would I want, how would I want to be given feedback? And that's the way that you should give feedback. Yeah. Like if you've been asked, you need to be responsible with your response in how you deliver that. Yeah, because you you yeah. ultimately have a have a sorry to keep using the word responsibility, but you do you have a responsibility to give that person the best the best assistance for their for their painting and not totally crush all their hopes and dreams that you, yeah. yeah and that's right. an you know. easy thing to do but it's not a useful thing to do because it's yeah. not actually helpful if you if you've been shown a model by someone maybe it's one of the first models they're painting they're asking for feedback mm. and you just sit there and rip it to pieces and tell them all the reasons why it's bad yeah that doesn't help them i'll but, always i'll always no. i think I've something no. to always say is always caveat and say look i'm gonna I, i'm gonna say it I'm, I'm gonna split it into those two categories the factual stuff you might not like yeah all right, okay, but I'm going to tell you because it's I'm trying to help you, you know. And I, and the other thing I would say is if you're asking for feedback, like don't just hunt for the good. Like yeah. you know, like if you're if you're asking for feedback because you want someone to inflate you inflate you a little bit, you like, want. Sometimes people are asking for it and they're just hunting for some gratification yeah. because I, I, they I, want to inflate I, their own ego. That's not unfortunately like just because you painted some of the edge highlights super sharp and straight, and you want someone to say, "Cool, your edges look super sharp and straight," or whatever, blah blah how much value is that going to give you as a painter when they're focusing on that? And really yeah. the thing that's going to be giving you benefit and aid is someone going, yeah, your edges are sharp and straight, but you, you, you've bled a little bit with all your shading, you know, like, yeah. you know, it, you, it like how your edge highlight might be great, but your pin shading or soft shading or deep shading might not be, might not be as well executed. It's like, you know, like for me, it's just like, you, I, you've got to give feedback in a way that it actually aids that person. And, and also as a receiver, understand that if you're asking for it, like I know people that are extremely direct and, and almost not brutal, but they're extremely direct with yeah. feedback because, because that's what they would want because they want to be, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I think if someone's telling you the positive all the time, that's not going to improve you as a painter. Well, I'm like, sure you've been on the receiving end of that is like, I've um, sometimes asked people for some feedback or some advice and I can tell that they're trying to be polite. Yeah. yeah. So I know that they're not being genuine with the feedback that they're trying to give me. Yeah. It's very, very nice to have people tell you that they love the model and whatever. But if you're actually humbly going to someone and asking for critique, I guess that's the difference, isn't it? If, if yeah. you're looking for like actual critique rather than inflation. It depends on what yeah. you're asking for, yeah. I think. Are you asking for someone's... I think for myself, it doesn't matter how brutal the technical uh, feedback is. I'm fine with that. Because, like you said, it's you know you you can see it on the model. It's factually there, and it, it, some, I need to do something in my process to change that to adapt. Whereas, or are you actually asking for someone's opinion? Yeah, and I always think I'd rather have someone's brutal, honest, technical advice rather than someone's brutal, brutal honest opinion on my my model. Because I always find it if you don't like it, that's your opinion. That's but that's not that going to give me, me sad. But that gives you nothing. That gives you nothing to <laughs> it, then yeah. progress. It makes with. me like, well. It makes me feel a bit. But oh, makes me feel a bit obviously unhappy that you don't like it. But like it, it doesn't. Like you say, it doesn't help me with what's wrong with it. I'd I, rather know what is wrong with it so that I can adapt as a painter. Like which is I always why try I, and distance myself from other people's uh, opinions of yeah of my things because. Ultimately, my opinions matter most on my work. So I, I do love it and I do value everybody's opinions on it, but I, I value people's uh, technical skill, um, yeah. skill-based opinions rather than their personal thing, taste on colours that I've used rather than that sort of that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, Because yeah. um, obviously as a sort of, sort of very beginner painter, I want to improve, mm. you know, and I'm looking for that those tips and advice and oh, you, but this is, I can, you know, from, especially from you guys' point of view, you can see immediately where I've gone wrong on things because you've got that level of experience. Whereas I haven't, I think, you know, I've done this and think, yeah, that's all right. But you can instantly spot things that I would never see. Yeah, but I, that, but Paul, I, I, also, I also have that. Like I, yeah. I ask people to critique my stuff and I, I'm in some circles of people that are way more advanced painters than me that have either factually won more mm. stuff than me or that have, you know, have been painting longer than me or whatever the case may be. And I have the exact same experience. Yeah. And I've been painting since I was six, but not, not Warhammer, obviously. The three years of it was, was AFX and stuff. And then from nine, it was obviously Warhammer and stuff. But 
I've been painting a couple of decades. Yeah. And I still have that now. Yeah, yeah. You know, like I still, I still, you know, I've had it before where I'll name names. I've had the wizard Rich Gray look at some of my, my yeah. models and, and I've been sat there with him and he's been to give me feedback and, and, and I've said to him, look, I'm not, you can't offend me. You can tear me a new one. Yeah, yeah. You know, like it doesn't bother me. Like, because I, I just want to know where my weaknesses are yeah. and where I'm not, not, where I'm not doing as good as I should, yeah. should be doing, my, for, for, you know. And, and it is grueling. You yeah. are going to feel like a bit, a bit silly, maybe if you've missed something or if you've left a gap there or yeah. things like that. But, but you will learn from that, you know. And 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 I think that's really something really important. Just to just to briefly segue into something, I think when it it's actually quite one thing to also be be conscious of when coming to, when it comes to feedback is like is actually asking someone that, and this is where it gets a little bit grey, which I'm going to explain about. But actually asking somebody that for you, mm. when you look at the stuff that they paint, yeah is a benchmark of where you want to go as a painter and they have tangible skill that you feel is better than yours. Yeah. Okay. And this is in, within the realms of art because obviously one painter might look at something yeah, and go, that's yeah. great. And the other person might look at it and go, it's not whatever, blah, blah. But as long as you are engaged with their painting and it looks in your opinion, better, more fact, more technically well executed, or yeah. you prefer the color choices or you prefer the way that it's actually formulated and done. Those are the things to determine whether that is the person you should be getting feedback or not. Yeah. It, like there could be another painter that maybe you don't like their work or you don't like the way they paint models that maybe on a technical level is better than this person that you do. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't not ask this person. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. It's, it has to be linear for you to look at that person's work and go, I think they're better than me based on this, 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 which is my opinion. I want the feedback from that person. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah that, that's, that's how I would always select somebody yeah, yeah, to give me feedback, you know. Yeah. Just on your point, the Rich Gray thing as well, I think it's important to maybe uh, acknowledge the sense of responsibility in the sense of you said to him, please be brutal with your feedback. I always maybe say just that, yeah. But mm. maybe just acknowledging the context of that the person has asked you for that feedback and trying to tailor your response because you don't want to just tear someone down yeah. who maybe wasn't expecting it and just blindsiding them because that's going to yeah, discourage. No, of course, of course yeah, yeah. yeah. No, you are right, yeah. I mean, I think, I think anyone who I've asked feedback for in the past knows that like, I don't really care what they say. Like, in yeah. the, not in the sense of the information, what they're saying. To in terms me, of not being it, offended. And not not yeah. being offended by it. Like, because the thing is, I wouldn't be asking them. Like, it's going back to the thing I said, I wouldn't be asking them if I didn't think, A, factually, they're a better painter than me. B, that I value their experience over mine totally. Yeah. Like, anything that they can help to steer my journey as best as possible for me is really complimenting them, if that makes yeah. sense, you know? So, so like, that doesn't bother me. And the thing is, is like, I do think part of it, I've got to be honest, I do think part of it is a mindset thing as well. Like for me, because of how I've always been in like super competitive with like wanting to do the best I can and, and then that kind of way, like ultimately when someone tells me something's crap or it's not smooth or it's not done better, yeah. I'm not, I won't say it in the way I normally say it, but like my mindset is I'm going to prove you wrong. Yeah. Like, and, um, and like, I think having that combined hunger for betterment for yourself as well as valuing the, the brutality of of honesty i think if you can combine those two things and synergize them together in the way that your mindset is and approach to painting i think you'll have massive gains when it comes to your execution and models yeah. i think it helps hugely so okay. so yeah mm. okay well speaking of mindset that comes to my final point on this list uh which is that thing of like a clean and tidy workspace, clean and tidy mind, clean and tidy results. Mm. I like the idea of being polite to your equipment and having a nice mm. organized working <laughs> environment. I'm getting a lot of looks as I say yeah. this. Uh, yeah, I'm, well, I'm half on half. It, it depends. It, for me, it depends how much space you have in your house to do your, yeah. your chosen hobby. So I've got like, if you can imagine an A4 a sheet of paper, I think my workspace is like a A2, mm. which is four times the size or something like that of an A4 sheet. A, a small desk. So I've got a very small little area that I try and cram everything onto it. Mm. So when I'm, my painting area is probably, is the untidiest small space you could <laughs> possibly imagine. But that interests me because I also have a very, very tiny hobby space. Which is why, to me, it's even more important that I keep yeah. it clean and tidy, so that I, I can I keep, keep my thoughts tidy organized between painting sessions. Because I put it away because obviously, you know, I've got a daughter, a six-year-old daughter, nearly seven now. But you know, all those paints and like, you know, I don't have glues and you know, my scalpel, everything, you know, all my hobby tools all lying around. They're all put away 
at the end of it. But during the process, it's like a grenade's gone off on my desk. <laughs> Let me unpack and, and go into everywhere. this a bit further before mm. we before we divulge too much. But if you're going a bit further into this, I do believe that being very methodical and like for cleaning all of your equipment so that it performs mm. as high as possible. And con- like this was a little thing that I didn't realize for way too long, which was like having a clean water cup so that you haven't got like metallic flakes like floating around in there and paint debris and whatever <laughs> that when you're painting the model is coming off and it's fighting yeah. you. Doing those small things to your workspace, in my opinion and in my experience, has led to cleaner results in my painting. Mm, yeah. I actually have three pots of water when I'm painting. Mm-hmm. Mm. Oh, um, you're one of those people. Yeah. Well, I, hey, I'm, I'm I don't know so, what that's meant I'm to mean. In, I, mean I, I, I use three. I, I always, I've always used three. I just have one for general getting the paint off my brush, one for my metallic mm-hmm. paint, and then I have another jar, which I generally use for diluting my paint down because I don't use my dirty water. Which one do you drink out of? I try, well, <laughs> I, every, every, sing, every single pot of water obviously ends up in my mouth because I always put my paintbrush in my mouth. Yeah. So, you know, always have a bit of a taste of all of them. But so I think the, the dirty paint one's my favourite, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and I also have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee always next. And it's always, I do this kind of Russian roulette thing. I mean, you know, don't, don't look. <laughs> oh, oh, not this time. Put your metallic in your tea. Yeah. Um, um, I, I use three cups of water, one for metallic, one for acrylic. And I just have one as like a, uh, almost like a, just a cleaning, a final clean. Final yeah. clean. Um, um, and I'll only really use that for when I'm using acrylics. So I'll clean massively in the first one. Right. Yeah. And then I'll go into the second one to give it right, a gotcha. clean. And my, all my metallic stays in metallic. And yeah. I, never, I, do that, I never do yeah. like a secondary clean from metallic no. in the, in the, in the thing. Cause I just, if I'm typically, if I'm working on metallics, I'll be doing all the metallics. So a little bit of extra metallic plate in with a metallic won't necessarily yeah. make too much of a difference if that makes sense. I know what you mean. Just to steer this back a little bit into the idea of the self-taught mini painter thing. I think part of the reason that I put this on the list was I think you develop a lot of bad habits because you, do, you don't yeah. necessarily know that what you're doing is negatively impacting you. For example, like I said about the, I used to be really, really lazy about cleaning my water pot mm. because I didn't realize that having a clean water pot would mean that there was less paint debris floating around, which means yeah. that there was less crap getting on my brush, which meant wasn't going on the model and so on. Or being really, really abusive to my brushes. I mean, we've done a whole episode on brush care. You don't realize these bad habits that you're mm. forming. So trying to, I guess, critically think about what it is you're doing with your setup and how it's impacting yeah. your painting. Definitely brush, brush care for me was a, a thing. I'd, like, in the past when I painted, finished painting, a little bit of water, straight in the mouth, stick it in the jar, job done. But I, now I, I'm starting to pay a bit more attention into to what I'm doing, obviously, uh, you know, but actually buying some better equipment, some better yeah. brushes. I want to take care of them, obviously, because, yeah. you know, I want I want those fine lines. I want to be able to... To paint and things, and so, if you look after those things, they'll look after you. Like, yeah, you know oh, I mean? it's that age-old thing, isn't it? You know, well, it's true though. That yeah. is that is the case. That's very much the case. Like, like the I see the amount of times I see people with like, I, I quite enjoy airbrushing, and the amount of times I see people that like have their airbrush and they're just like, oh, I'm done with it now. I'll just sort of put it down on the desk, and it's like drying up, and they've got all paint mm. in there. And then the airbrush gets this stigma of being like quite a difficult, cumbersome tool to work with because it's always clogging up. But really, it's a user mm. issue because, for example, when I finish uh, with my airbrush. I'll spray loads of water through it just to flush everything out. Then I'll disassemble the airbrush. I'll clean the needle. I'll clean the nozzle well, out. Reassemble airbrush cleaners going through it so that it re-lubricates all of the seals. And next time it's ready to use and I haven't got this barrier of like, okay, mm, want to airbrush. Oh, I it's didn't clean it out last time. I've got to spend 25 yeah, yeah. minutes. You know? Yeah. No, I, I want to steer it back onto the thing about desks. It's for me, that's very something that me and Adam are very similar about next door. So we actually have a very, very similar approach to, to our hobby setup. So I, I, I've got a decent sized working area, which I'm privileged to have, which is which is great. But um, I, I am a bit like, I, I see the end, when I finish a project, the cleaning of the desk for me is like, is like the return to normality, if that makes sense. I, yeah. like, I like, I like when I'm working, I like having loads of things around me, like those are things that I can just, oh, I'm, you know, if I'm mid flow, I'm like, oh, I'm doing a cake. Maybe I should glaze some purple into that green cloth just to give it like a, a bit of a harmonious sort of shadow color or something like that, blah, blah. Like I like having loads of things and options around me. So I find it helps with that creative yeah. flow or process, but that's just me personally. Like, and my desk starts really neat, tidy, yeah. perfect, etc., And then more it just chaos. descends into visual chaos. Yeah. Like, and then I finish the model. I'm like, yeah, I'm glad the model's done, et cetera, blah, blah. 
before I start another project or start another model or even, mm. you know, even a session at sometimes, I'm literally like, I've got to get, I can't handle it being left like this and then I've got yeah, a full clean, clean you know, yeah. et cetera. Um, so my desk goes from being super neat and organized to absolute carnage and then yeah. it returns back to, back to tranquility uh, before a new project starts or a new day starts or something like that. That's how it's always yeah. been for me. And and that doesn't work for a lot of people. Like you, like George, for example, he will tell you right now, like everything has to be like clinical, like a, like a, <laughs> like, like, a, like, a, like a surgery, like, yeah. and, like everything neat, and which is fine. It's perfect. That, that, that is, and it, I, I think talking about the sort of tying into the thing we said about earlier, it depends on the person sitting at the desk. Like I do agree with that. Like just to caveat, like yeah. what I'm more talking about in the sense of like, if you're a self-taught person building those bad habits with your setup that are, are fighting you, if you get what I mean. I, I, I would say that one person's bad habits are not the same as somebody else's bad habits. No, that's, that's fair. I mean, in the sense up, of like the objective things like you're speaking about earlier. So like good brush care, like yeah. good etiquette with mm. your setup, closing the lids on your paints properly, yeah. that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I agree totally. I, I just think that like, uh, f for me, I don't get visually distracted. Like, I don't have any like uh, situational distraction or situational like distraction from those things being around me which so it doesn't affect my my sort of like focus on the miniature yeah. for some people like that, that that do like to obviously have like a cleaner working area or whatever blah blah like that i can understand totally why like loads of paints with colors and all this stuff around you feel focused on the model and you've got like a bright green over here and a bright red over yeah i understand totally how that could be distracting of attention like don't get me wrong um, it does just boil down to the, the the end user at the end of the day and, and what they find a better working environment for, for them is. I agree with that. I'm not necessarily suggesting that if you're tidy, you're going to have better models because that's not mm. true. But I do believe in the mindset of like looking after everything, trying to be as like caters your, your workflow. So if you are someone who likes to have stuff everywhere, that's fair enough, but make sure everything's like looked after yeah. and you're responsible with the stuff that you own so that you can get the best possible results. Yeah, I yeah. Agree. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's it, yeah, it's like you say, going back to brush care, it's 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 no good expecting nice crisp lines if your the hairs on your brush are all north and south. Is it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, it's just not going to work. So no, no. you you've got to take that. There's a certain discipline involved with that sort of thing, isn't there? You've got to, it's got to become part of your painting process. process. Yeah, uh, when you sit down to paint, you know, knowing that you've got the tools there and they're in good condition because the last time you painted and did stuff, you took a few minutes just to clean them properly and yeah. make sure that you know the water's out of the ferrule and all the rest of it um yeah so it is important i am actually going <laughs> i thinking of i think because my desk is so small and everything is so cluttered um i do sometimes think oh, <laughs> sod it. I, you know i'll do it another time but we've all had those days that yeah, of course like, you, you do know, yeah um, um but I, i'm actually and also now because i'm sort of progressing in my painting I'm actually accumulating more things. Yeah. So the, you know, the process. There is a difficulty up, in that. There is, whereas, you know, I started off with one or two brushes. I've now got a jar with like 20 brushes in. I'm not going to comment. So I know, yeah, but yeah. for my, you know, my sort of low leveling things, you know, and I've got Tupperware old sandwich boxes full of my paints, you know, that are just stacked in the corner and I'm things. Not gonna, I'm not going to comment. Then, <laughs> of course, <laughs> when the ones I want to use are all over the desk. So I think if I, I think progressing, I think for my own sort of inner tranquility, it'd be quite nice to have a proper desk, a proper area with some proper paint. It is, it is nice. It does give you that again. It's that, it's that, it's that set up and pack down time. It's yeah. that, you know, having that stuff just there instantly accessible. Having said that though, I've had both extremes. I've had very, very tiny little desk that was folded up in a hallway i've had uh, all, i used to paint on the windowsill <laughs> yeah. I, that used to be my hobby area when i was a, uh, you know as a young lad yeah. growing up that used to be where that's where my mother only allowed me to paint in my yeah. bedroom uh, on the windowsill which was sort of sure. up here yeah but, yeah <laughs> crying <laughs> <laughs> painting a, you know painting the some mini, some random solid rubber figure that i found at the local cheap shop you know, just to practice some painting on when I was a kid. So that's, you know, we've all been there. We've yeah. all had those. To my point though, like I've, I've had, and I've also had on the other end, like I used to rent an office space out just when I was painting full time mm. and I had the luxury of having loads and loads of room and I had multiple desks and airbrushed yeah. stuff and it was all great. At the minute, I'm at a very, very humble, I guess more average setup where yeah. I've got a dedicated desk for it, but you know, it lives in the corner. The general the hobbyist. Room. Yeah. But <laughs> that being said, I've never felt that while it made my life easier and it was much more efficient when I was, you know, doing it for work, mm. having all of that space, 
I've never really felt that it made a difference to my actual quality of my work. I think that this falsehood that if you're going to have this massive hobby desk with your big hobby zone drawers and all the shelves, well, that's going to make you better. You're just going to accumulate more stuff yeah, and you might, have it, you might have a lower barrier to set up time and there are a lot of creature comforts and quality of life upgrades that come with yeah. that. Completely understand. But I feel like I'm at my best painting level that I've ever been at in my life yeah. and I've got one of the smallest setups I've had mm. in the different I, houses. For me personally, I find it quite annoying. I get quite annoyed if I... If, knowing that I need something and it's not to hand and I know that it's in a box over there somewhere. But I still have that now. and I, I have I, to get I, up and get... I have that now. And You're I've an got, extreme. I, yeah, I, I, I <laughs> promise. I'm a very I promise, I'm a fringe case here, but yeah. Like, I promise I, myself yeah. if I got a bigger desk and had some proper racks, it'd all be... I wouldn't buy anything. Yeah, I don't need to that, buy anything no, extra. I'm telling you, and then that becomes I'm, your new benchmark and then you fill all I'm, that stuff I'm out telling and you, get more. From, from, from being <laughs> at that point and more... Yeah. Like it doesn't, it doesn't get that way. So don't, don't think that the de the, the desk with the storage and all that stuff <laughs> nah, might, means you don't buy I, more. I would you never do. do that. I, I would do. never do that. You know, you, you say that, be but trust me, you, you will. Like you will, hundred percent. And I'm sure anyone watching this or listening to this has been in the exact same situation. Or if I just get that one more rag, it means I can organise yeah. those paints that are in that box there. And then that box is empty. Oh, then there's this new paint range that's just come out. Oh, I'm just going to try five of those paints. Oh, why not? I'll just, just get I'll put ten put of something them. else yeah, in yeah, that box. You know, know, like sort of back to square one. Aren't yeah, it, it, trust me, it doesn't get any so, better. Like I think, yeah, I, I I don't know what the solution or answer is to that because I'm at one end of the spectrum and and like and I still have that problem now. Yeah, and I've got I've got good storage. I've got good. I've got drawers. But that can got, also but got, yeah. That sort of thing can bring me out of my you know, headspace when I'm painting, you know, if I've got to nip off somewhere and go through yeah. the cupboard and find something that I should have got before I started painting, mm -hmm. I didn't realise I would probably need, that can sort of take me out of the, the zone, as it were, sometimes. Question of the week time. Thank you, everyone, for submitting your questions for question of the week. If you have a question that you would like us to answer in this segment of the show, please leave a comment down below on YouTube, or if you are listening on any of the audio platforms or apps, Please fire us a DM on Instagram at Siege Studios or at Paint Perspective Podcast. This question comes from, once again, Grimdark Mark. Thank you, Grimdark Mark. You're uh, really the banner bearer for question of the week at the minute. <laughs> Step up your game, other listeners. <laughs> uh, Grimdark Mark says, Hi team, it's me again. As a lover of the Grimdark settings of Warhammer and a huge Imperial Guard fan, and more recently the new Cities of Sigmar sculpts, my God, they're beautiful models, your style is very much heavy metal from what I've seen, but how would you go about grimdarking your oh-so-crisp lines? Would you oil wash a uh, new, new acrylic weathering medium? Let me know. All the best and love the show. I will jump in if that's Yeah, because okay. I can't do Mark's art, so... Well, you, you have. Well, you're, you're, I'm get, you're, your Nurgle um, yeah. model is, 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 it is grim dark. It's a the Nurgle, it's got a darker yeah. feel to it, which is... But I, I suppose, is this in like the context of space marines and armour chipping? Oh, oh, like let that, me re rewind this. So basically, we've spoken about this a little bit on previous episodes. So there's this idea that to be grim dark, your model needs to be mm. absolutely battered, covered in mud and yeah. rust and falling apart. And we've argued on the podcast that Grimdark as a visual style is not necessarily conducive to that. So you can still paint a box art, heavy metal style model and still have it feel very grimdark yeah. and very gritty. It's a minimalist kind of... I think yeah, but it's also, in the, it's also in the sense of like the color choices that you use Correct, and how, yeah. you, how you approach painting the model in looking at it more of a atmospheric piece. So treating the model as a whole, maybe rather than individual panels, yeah, of course. looking at like glowing techniques and things mm -hmm. like that. James, far away. So this has always been an interesting one for me. I think there's, as we mentioned, there's many different styles of execution, et cetera, but you can still approach them with your way of doing it and still have something that is in keeping with that style of execution, but just done in your level of, uh, level yeah. of approach. Um, a good example of that is um, I've totally, totally forgotten the, the, the painter. And I just want to say that now, just so I'm not being rude. I will get a picture of it flashed up on the, on the, um, on the, uh, on the wall there. This for me is it's a it's a dreadnought that were that won at Golden Demon and visually in the pictures when it was first seen people were like oh that what's so special about that blah blah like I saw comments and things like that and I was I already like, know the one you mean just like, from saying yeah, that yeah mm. and I was like number one like you have to look at the model and thoroughly and look at the model to understand the sheer level of effort that went into that model like every single bit of scratch or damage or chipping or grime or interest that's been applied to the sarcophagus and, and armor armature of that dreadnought has been done individually and had 
hours of investment put on it and with intention and with yeah with yeah. intent to give it that overall finish of the way that the model looks the, the sheer skill that it takes to give a, 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 a consistent random like consistent and random are these two oxymorons yeah. like we, we've had it before in classes where people get very very much in the frame of mind of executing damage on a model and they'll cookie cutter the chip shape or the yeah. because it's like that oh they're just in the zone of doing that yeah yeah so doing weathering over a whole entire model and making every single aspect of it look random but with intent obviously of application because it's been put yeah. on there is something that quite frankly like you need the most patience and the most it's controlled skill and- controlled execution to do like I think for our style of painting and I say our style of painting in a very broad spectrum because again uh, you know box art style can be interpreted and been done in many different ways but if we're talking strictly like heavy metal for example then color choices are very important i think that you, you you really need to select a set of colors which are a bit more desaturated a bit obviously darker and i'm not trying to use a parody of the name but a lot darker tones typically but then grim the, colors you know. grim colors yeah. yeah in the same respect you can also use saturated colors to insinuate certain things or to have certain like draw attention visually to make the person reading or looking at the model visually see something so for example you could have a very dark overall miniature mm. but for example like a light could be quite a saturated color just yeah. to, in, to draw the eye and attention to that specific part of it um there's some of the best the best examples of that are like uh, it's not even 40k so it's like more time so obviously grim dark comes mm. from the man the myth the legend that is john blanche obviously and all of his artwork and stuff there were some amazing Mordheim miniatures back yeah. in the day where you'd have like a really sort of like desaturated, grim kind of looking like flagellant or someone like that. And then they have had like a, a, a brazier or something with some flames on it or something, you know, like there's very, there's some really good ways of approaching that style of painting from different or that, that final execution, not style, sorry, that, that final execution of miniature, but with various different stylistic approaches. As I said, like you can have a very refined, very clean in execution yeah. not as in clean and overall comp- the way that it looks and visually reads but a clean execution whereby every single little bit has been been like, decided upon with sheer intent and the, that specific bit of chipping or scratching or streak or run or moisture around the rivet or subtle subtle rusting on a certain area has all been decided yeah Okay, we have our little closing tradition on the show called Hobby Hacks. This is where we share a little hobby hack with you that you can implement into your painting. Paul, you dropped the knowledge bomb of the sprue last I week, did, so you've yeah. got quite a bar to uh, I know. To yeah, here. well, this is... I mentioned a potato earlier. Obviously, I'm not going to... There's no hack for the potato. I'll tell you what you can do. You can practice drilling with a drill and a potato. You can also... Right, you're I doing it about- again. You're doing that thing where you just make up a nonsense <laughs> hack off the cuff no thought or regard, absolutely worth it. Brown and waffle. Yeah, but, but, but bonus paint perspective points. There's if you a, practice your drilling in the potato. There's, yeah. I did hear there's a good sort of hack of involving slate in a bag. Yeah, that was another, yeah, that was yeah. another great one. Yeah, I'll just yeah. throw that in. Yeah. That was a good um, hack. I'm, I'm standing by that one. This question is um, as much as a, as, a, as a hack, as more as a, as a tip, I suppose, uh, especially from like coming from, I suppose, a, a beginner level, I guess. And that is, I, I'm sort of learning about contrast now, mm-hmm. sort of, because I'm I've always sort of highlighted and shaded colours using white in the mix or black in the mix. So that's totally fine, but you end up with kind of a muted colour version of yeah. that colour or pastelised with white. So it, I think sort of my sort of tip for for this time is um, is sort of be brave enough uh, to use contrast or push yourself to use contrast much higher than you usually would so instead of can we just clarify that you yeah, mean so contrast is in the visual medium in the, not, yeah, not, in, the paint. not not the paint, the paint. No, no yeah no. yeah forget the contrast paints but as in the sort of the visual uh color medium so um pushing colors to be yeah brighter as, with bigger yeah. jumps than you might expect so rather than sort of adding white to you 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 mix it for a highlight try like for greens and things try i don't know try try, try using uh like an elf flesh or a nice yellow in the mix, just to, to, to add something different to it. I'm also using sort of thing. I'm also, uh, I would sort of suggest getting into color theory because my goodness, color, th- that's, that's a whole nut, that's a whole another thing. It's that, a deep rabbit hole. That's, that uh, yeah. So quick five minute hack, just learn color yeah, theory. Just <laughs> learn color theory, take that away. I mean, I was knocking George with slate, but I mean, that's a, that's a massive step up from but that. Like, I mean, like, 
for, for, for things like uh, for shading, you don't have to use black or brown for shading. Use purple. Yeah. 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 Use purple for shading. Mental, right? <laughs> but it is so good. It's like I did a playground a little while ago, um, and I did my usual thing of you know wraith bone undercoat, and then I gave the whole thing a purple. Uh, I think it was lin- Lynch Lynch purple. Lynch purple wash. I just washed the whole thing purple, and then did the green over the top. It was so much fun. I mean, <laughs> it was. It, it didn't really look that great at the end of it because the execution of it wasn't terribly great, and of course, it was an experiment sort of thing. But that process of just having some fun, yeah, and doing something, having a bit of a, just taking the time out every now and again to have a bit of an experiment with something. Yeah. Don't feel yourself sort of shoehorned in. I've got to do this, so I need to do this. But on the contrast thing, I mean, Joe, Joe really killed me for this one. I said it on the episode, but I do think it ties into your point. Was it is right what you say, like pushing contrast to be brighter mm. and bolder than you think it needs to be because yeah. it does have that visual impact on a model that's so small. It helps define the detail. Yeah, yeah. When I was first painting, I was really, really going for smoothness. And mm. in that, I would end up killing all of the contrast on the model. Because yeah. I'd be trying to blend out the color difference. But yeah. what was the point of putting that brighter color on the model in the first place? I would also suggest, like, if your model is sort of predominantly a certain color, say, I don't know, like a Death Garden Marine, like green or whatever, try doing the base as the opposite complement to that color mm. on the color wheel. So if, if you, you know, say something that's mostly green, try doing some sort of groundwork that's sort of purple, kind of purple. Mm. So that's kind of the con, a nice sort of color contrast between the two there and adds a bit of dynamicism. Is that the right word yeah, to sure. use yeah, between yeah, yeah. the two things? And it just, I, I think that, I mean, that's just great because I always just do my bases, you know, black with a gray, dry brush or brown with a bit of a dry brush on it. It's not exactly visually interesting, mm-hmm. but if you can sort of push yourself to use a little bit of more contrast than you're comfortable with, that's yeah. what I'd say. So yeah. like push yourself out of that comfort zone boundary that you sort of, fo- sort of not necessarily, you sort of subconsciously force on yourself. Mm-hmm. It's sort of breaking through that and experimenting a little bit. So I, yeah, I would sort of say, say so I've just have a, a, a painting session where you just go mental with color. <laughs> I love that. that. That's You're, the best hobby hack ever. Just go mental with go color. Just mental, go mental with color. See, I, it's, it's what I'm here for, really. <laughs> <laughs> just okay. go mental with colors. Just just go crazy with it. Well, instead of just doing a one color base coat, say like purple as your base color, do three. Just go mental and just do like three random colors in stripes over it and then paint your model as you would normally and just see what that looks like okay well uh, on that note thank you everyone for listening to this week's episode of paint perspective if you could please support the show by doing all of the things like liking subscribing to the channel following us on apple podcasts or spotify liking the video leaving a comment down below for question of the week thank you everyone we will catch you next week 